Hello everyone and good evening. So today's topic is going to be the beginner's quest in Google CTF 2018 qualification round. Since uh, last year we got a lot of feedback that uh, yeah the challenges are a little too hard so perhaps we should um, do some easier ones. So this is what uh, the folks in the Google CTF team did this year. And there were uh, I think 19 or 20 beginner's challenges. Um, well, during the CTF, which were um, not the part of the main ranking, but uh, so so basically you could have fun with them, you could solve them in free time. And they are still up, by the way, so, well, the CTF ended uh, yesterday, basically, yesterday at night. So, yeah, it will be up for some time, but it's not in maintenance mode anymore, so it's up, um, if you're lucky. The challenges should be available later on to download anyway, so uh, there's that. Anyway, um, so usually what I do at my streams is I wait about 10 minutes, 15 minutes for all the, all the folks to show up, so let's do that today as well. Maybe uh, lower the camera a little and move it here. Okay, here we go. So, um, one thing, since I, I think there are a lot of uh, new folks today uh, due to the CTF topic, um, if you have any questions at any time, then do ask my moderator. And my moderator today is Kshaku. His nickname is right here. You can see it in the corner of the screen. And uh, Kshaku will be able to pass the questions to me and I will be answering them from time to time. Um, meaning I will normally focus on solving the challenge, uh, but uh, when I have a spare time or want to make a break, I will uh, focus on the questions. And if there are um, some questions left at the end of the stream and I still have some voice cap capability, I will um, I will answer them as well. Cool. So um, let's talk maybe a little to kill the time um, about the city of itself. Oh, but before we get there, uh, wait, I need to reconfigure my keyboard. Okay, it's fine now. This is uh, Kshakus, my moderator's website. If you're into C++, you should check it out. It's, it's dev.kshaku, which is written as K R. Z -A -Q dot cc. So check it out, and um, and yeah, and let Kshaku know that he should update it more often. And this is the Google CTF uh, website. Let's let's actually enter it again because there is this cool animation. So the uh, competition was basically split into again two categories there was the main qualification round for the google uh, ctf finals which will happen in autumn um, and uh, 10 teams qualified so we can see them here it's uh, ppp who won uh, the plate parliament of pwning a really good team from the us then dragon sector was uh, the second team a team from poland um, spam and hex a team from hungary uh, qualified from the third place 5bc in all honesty, I'm sorry, I do not know from where 5BC is. Van Pasten from Israel qualified from the fifth place, P4 from Poland, Tokyo Westerners from Japan, Devcore from uh, Devcore Root from Korea, I believe. Um, AE, I have I have absolutely no idea. But they qualified from the ninth place and leave cat dash plus, which again I have no idea. I, I never I don't think I ever heard about this team. Um, so it might be either a new merge or I'm lacking some knowledge. My apologies if that's the case. There were, in the main track, there were 25 tasks in total and uh, 22 were solved by the top team, by PPP. So, uh, and I don't think all the tasks were solved. One task wasn't solved. So, um, yeah, this is the, the main CTF and these are the tasks from the main CTF. I made uh, three of them myself. Wired CSV was mine, uh, Better Zip was mine and um, back to the basics was mine. Uh, the unsolved task was drive, by the way. And I will talk about the challenges I've made for the main track of the CTF, I think in next week or in two weeks or something like that. So um, I am not going to talk about them today because if you go to the readme, there is something which is quite unique to the Google CTF, which is a write up um, competition. So. If you solve the task, you can write a write-up, and then you can submit the write-up until the end of the June, so until the end of the week, basically, um, to the competition, and you can win prizes from $100 to $500 per write-up. Um, and uh, yeah, the best write-ups are going to be uh, to be picked. Uh, basically, one, um, I don't know why it's 
uh, 21 here, but we'll, um, yeah, I, I think it was supposed to be one per, ch per task, but we'll figure it out. J just read what's written here because that's uh, what is actually true. So, um, yeah, I totally encourage you if you have solved any tasks from the main CTF and you feel strong with uh, either writing skills or making video um, videos, you know, like Life Overflow with us, for example, then do it, submit it, and you may get additional prizes if you, even if you have not won in the CTF or qualified in the CTF. And if you did, then, like, you know, even more rewards. That's great. Apart from that, because the challenges on the main track were quite challenging, actually. Mm, that was the idea, you know, you you have to test the teams, right? And uh, they cannot be too easy. So apart from that, if you're new into CTFs, you could play the Beginner's Quest. And the Beginner's Quest was all about cakes. And if you've played it, and if you chatted with Wintermuted, who is, uh, like, really into cakes, then... But yeah, you know, it, it was about cakes. And it was uh, about cakes, uh, but also about solving a little easier CTF challenges. They weren't easy. I mean, uh, the challenges were not trivial. Okay, this challenge was easy. It was it was trivial. Uh, but if you got somewhere around this area, like, things weren't easy anymore. So, um, I, I guess, like, uh, if you're, you know, like a hardcore CTF player, then you could easily go through them all. If you're new to CTFs, they might have posed a challenge for you. Now, these um, challenges were made by a team who was uh, responsible for making the beginner's quest, and all kudos go, goes to them. Um, the folks are amazing, and they did a really, really good job with it uh, from, from my perspective. So uh, thank you for doing that. I, um, I basically chatted with a lot of you on the, you know, a lot of players of beginner's quest on IRC, both during the CTF, after, and like the feedback was, was good, it was really good. So well done, well done. And uh, yes, uh, that also means that I wasn't uh, a part of making the beginner's quest, but I did solve all the challenges before this live stream um, as part of testing the CTF. So um, I know the challenges and I'm going to go through them probably rather quickly because in the end it's about 20 of them. So, uh, you know, I, I cannot get stuck on them for too long. If I will get stuck on any challenge and I will not be able to solve it, I will probably just skip it. But I don't think that will happen. I will also try to be explaining all the time what exactly am I doing with the challenge. So I will try to tell you, you have to do this because of this, and you have to do this because of this. If you have any questions, then again, do ping my moderator today, who is Kshaku. You can see uh, his nickname here, either on our IRC channel or on our YouTube channel, and he will pass me the questions and I will then be able to well, to try to answer the question. Apart from that, um, yeah, so again, I'm going to wait two more minutes, I think, to uh, for the folks who are still showing up uh, to to show up and then I will I will start with the CTF. Um, I guess we can we can go through the story. So cakes throughout history, they were they are long promised, not often delivered, either real. Um, are they fabrications of an internal system long designed to tease and tempt you with promises of sweet confectionery uh, goodness that will satisfy and delight, or the realistic truth of the matter? A dark conspiracy involving many clandestine, I'm sorry, I'm not a native speaker, my apologies, clandestine organization that want to create content and context around the very existence of this delicacy. Your task, uncover the truth, find the cake and show it to the world. Set the truth free. You do not have to start this undermining of the cake world order CWO without any information. Our informants deep in the field, some no longer with us, have passed on intel um, about an operative within the CWO known as Wintermuted, which um, whom you could basically speak with on IRC if you played during the CTF. Their home is a mess of old technologies, poor, poor operational security or OPSEC, and Internet of Things or IoT devices that haven't seen updates in decades. Despite being released last year, uh, despite being released last year, okay, that's, <laughs> that's quite funny, um, but that's also quite true. Anyway, um, start with the rubbish bin. Surely there's a letter or 
toothpaste tube there with some information that will um, get you on the inside. Uh, that's called the dumpster diving, by the way. Your goal, I guess if you watch like old hacker mov movies, there must be a dumpster diving scene in there. Your goal is to get the cake in the fridge, uh, where else would you put cake in your smart home? So this is the story, basically. We are going through IoT devices and servers in the home of a cake world order um, um, agent, I guess, or person. Uh, known as winter muted and we have to get the cake and the cake is basically here so yeah as you can see cake so we'll have to get the cake and to get there we'll have to solve uh, well some path of the challenges so we can go here for example we could go here you know this is a graph so we could go here and so on so i'm actually going to solve all the challenges today like uh, all of them and they are color color coded i think I don't remember, I think this was MISC, this was web, this was pawnable, I don't remember what this was. We'll see when we go. Cool. Um, so, yeah, I guess we can start with this. And again, um, if you have any questions, do ask Shaku. He will pass me the questions which are related to the challenges I am solving immediately, and the rest of the questions I will answer after the stream if I have time. And apart from that, I will, all the scripts I'm going to write today are going to be put on my GitHub. So, um, yeah, if you're rewatching the live stream later on, then that, it should be already on my GitHub. Otherwise, uh, it, it will be linked by the in the description of the video. Otherwise, yeah, have fun and enjoy. Mm, again, let me just create a directory for this. Okay, I have uh, on my second monitor a file explorer where I'm just creating a, a directory for the CTF. I will try to not make a mess and actually create a directory for each task that usually works for me on my CTF. But let's see how it goes. Perfect. So the first, um, yeah, the first challenge is called the letter. Oh, sorry. And. Um, I think that's a tag garbo can or garbage can, I guess. It really went dumpster diving. Amazing. After many hours success between what looks like a three week old casserole and uh, a copy of Relative Time magazine. Relative Time, well, that's actually funny. Uh, you found this important looking letter about the victim's PC. However, the credentials aren't readable. Can you still obtain them? And we have an attachment. So let's download this. Here we go. I'm going to create a challenge name letter, or a directory named letter. Then I'm going to unzip it. It's a zip file which I downloaded. And what do you see there? Well, wait, maybe I can show you actually uh, my file explorer. Here we go. Yeah, it's a, uh, after unzipping, it's just a PDF file. So it was uh, in this weirdly named file. Um, by the way, if you're uh, new to CTFs, then you might be wondering why is the name so weird. So there are actually two purposes for that. First, the name has to not has to be not guessable because uh, otherwise people could download challenges like before the CTF starts. For example, just guessing name them right because you know you have to usually release the challenges a few minutes earlier. It depends on the, on your setup. Uh, the other thing is if you actually calculate. Um, a checksum of that, for example, I think this is SHA-256, let's do just that, SHA-256 uh, sum of FFA file, it actually, mm, let's do it again, uh, let's do it once more, yeah, actually it's the, um, it has too much, like the file checksum has too much of a name, so this is F, sorry, 5AOF, and the checksum, sorry, this is the checksum and this is the name of a file is the same. So basically it's for you to check if you have downloaded the, the correct, the file correctly. Um, yeah, so, okay. It's a PDF file, let's open it. And um, as you can see, there is blah, 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 and something is redacted. The username and the password is redacted. So there are several ways how to redact stuff in a PDF, but usually the way to, it, Usually it's like this, there are layers in PDF. So on the bottom layer you have text and if something, if someone just put on the upper layer um, a black rectangle or two, like this might be it, 
then you can still interact with the bottom layer easily. So let's just do Control A to select everything, copy and grab a note file. And we copied actually it with credentials, which means that we uh, there was just a black rectangle over the password. So this was the first challenge and we already have a flag. Um, otherwise to solve it, you could basically find it in a PDF, which um, object in the PDF is a re black rectangle and remove it, but that's like, yeah, it worked like this. So we have three new challenges ready. Okay. So let's uh, go from the top, I guess. Here we go. OCR is cool, and this is a MISC challenge. Mm, Caesar, and, and this is already a giveaway, but this is probably a ci Caesar cipher or mm, something related to it. So Caesar cipher is also called uh, rot free, like rotate free. And this might be actually not rotate free, but rotate anything like rotate n. So this is what we will look at. Like the first word again being a giveaway. Caesar once said, don't stab me, but uh, taking a screenshot of an image sure feels like being stabbed. Um, um, oh, okay, uh, so uh, about the... Uh, Adam Vogue basically says that uh, if uh, the text is just blacked out in the PDF, and I, I don't think that was the case in this uh, in this challenge, but if the, challenge is, the text is just blacked out, maybe you can just select the text and uh, by highlighting it, you, you basically get to see what's under the black color anyway, or the, whatever redacted color is being used, obviously. Now, um, let's go back to this. You connected to a VNC server on Fubanizer 9000. It was uh, view only, so we couldn't interact with it. VNC is, you know, like RDP, it's remote management of, uh, of the desktop, basically. The screenshot is all that was present, uh, but it's, uh, gibberish can you recover the original text and um yeah let's download it i'm going to make the new directory ocr is cool here we go okay boom now um this is uh, i think yeah this one so let's see what's this this looks like a screenshot from uh, from inbox uh, yeah, this is, I guess, the message identifier. Then we have some text, and uh, the text looks... Yeah, the text actually looks like it's... Um, it's just like rot and encoded. It's, it doesn't have to be scissor cipher, but it's rot and encoded. So let's, I guess, use a o OCR mm, on this. OCR is basically, you know, software which does... Uh, reads text from an image. I have GOCR installed already, so we can use that. And yeah, this is basically the, the text, so let's just dump it to a file, notes.txt. Here we go. And I have this very some blah blah blah, gibberish gibberish, and it doesn't look that bad. I am pretty sure some um, letters are not correct, but maybe this will be enough. I am going to find a random website which will decipher this for me because, uh, yeah, on the, on CTS this is what you do. If you know something has been implemented by a million people already, then just just look for it. Don't waste time to re-implement it. So rot n and uh, rot uh, decoder. Okay, this, this, maybe this, no, hmm. I don't know, let's try this, the crypt or the cipher. No, this is ASCII, I don't want ASCII, I want just letters of alphabet. That was probably cool, but let's move it here. So, uh, you know what, I'm going to actually jump here and remove the, this stuff up to here. So this isn't it, maybe this, no, not readable, not readable, rot3, not readable, not readable, not rot5, not readable, 6, not readable, 7, readable. Dear customers, we are happy to welcome us, uh, you, I guess, as our new blah blah blah. This is kinda, um, you can read it, but it's uh, like this due to the OCR not being able to get the letters correctly, but 
let's try to, I, I guess I'm going to just copy paste it to uh, notes2.txt. Here we go and let's try to read it. Oh, CTF, CTF, uh, this is. Um, mm, okay, CTF uh, something, substitution something. Let's, uh, I'm going to transcribe manually this part because this is obviously gibberish. Mm. So I'm going to trans transcribe this to, uh, from the image again. So is the image open? The image is open and I guess this is, this is, I guess this part because this looks like it might be, no, it's, it's not this part, it's this part. Yeah, because you see the brackets here, right? And you see the capital letters here, so it might be it. I'm going to do control Y, uh, oops, whatever. And okay, let's transcribe it. Let's make it a little bigger. Here we go. So I guess it's uh, Y, okay, V, T, X, L, T, K, V, B, I, A, X, K, B, L, T, L, N, L, M, B, M, N, M, B, H, G, V, B, I, A, X, K. Okay. And let's put it again here. Here we go. Okay. And it says Caesar cipher is a substitution cipher, which is correct. It is a substitution cipher. So I guess with, this means that uh, we have a challenge solved. Let's put it here and let's try the flag. Okay, here we go. It's solved. Now, I think the challenge changed a little from when I solved it. When I solved it, it was a little different and the, the flag was actually, if, if we open the image again, let's do just that. Yeah, the fl flag was actually here. And it's uh, the text after you decipher it, it said, yeah, look at the link and uh, and the flag, the secret will be there and just add CTF there. But the image quality was also way worse. So I think it was replaced later during the challenge, which is a good thing, I think. Mm, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, this is exactly what guest said, that the uh, guest also had this... Uh, this version of a challenge, which I also saw uh, before in, in the other variant. So I guess it's a little easier because now it's in the text actually. So let's uh, close this. I'm going to hit my timer button since... Yeah, I have basically a button for noting where, when the challenge was solved so I can later do links under the video. Floppy. Floppy is going to be the next challenge, Floppy. And um, using the credentials from the letter, you logged in to the Fubanizer 9000 PC. It has a floppy drive. Why? There are there is an ICO file on the disk, but it doesn't smell right. Um, this might be a hint, but there might be something hidden in the floppy. So let's download it. And sorry, which file was it? It was this one. Here we go. So yeah, uh, indeed there is an ICO file and it looks like this. Uh, it's from Borland. Borland was a was I think was a company which was making compilers back in the days. Um, if it's uh, supposed to be fishy, then let's maybe try and run file on it. So file who ICO. It says something like this. Then let's run binwalk on it. Uh, do I have binwalk installed? Yes, I do have. Binwalk is a tool which uh, tries different to find sub files inside a file. So if you have like for example an echo file and then at the end of it is a JPEG file. Uh, then you can find it with binwalk. And binwalk is also pretty cool for like walking through drives to, to find files and so on, like uh, drive images. And it says uh, blah 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 zip archive, perfect. So uh, let's change our name to zip. And uh, let's... Uh... Oh, there are two files. There is www.com. As you can see, it's an executable. And uh, there is driver txt. So let's look at the driver txt. And here we have this is the driver for the aluminium key hardware password storage device. Cool. And this is it. In case of emergency, run www.com. So this isn't a URL, this is a .com file. .com files are executables from, you know, good old 16-bit DOS times. So something which hasn't been really in use for about 20 years, but... but yeah. Okay, so that was floppy. 
And now uh, I guess we are going to look at the dub 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 later on, but before we get there, let's go here on the Mar challenge. Mm, okay, so uh, my apologies, Mar. Cool. Finding yourself on the Fubanizer 9000, a computer built by uh, 9000 Foos. This computer is so complicated, luckily it serves manual pages through manual pages. This is already interesting. Through a network service. As the old saying goes, everything you need to find is in the manual. Okay, and we have to use Netcat to connect there. Okay, so let's do just that. Do I have a console open? No, I don't. So I'm going to spawn one, a Linux one. I prefer to use Netcat over Linux. So this is a Linux console. I'm running, by the way, both Windows and Linux. Linux is a VM which is running in the background. So I can spawn a window and this is actually Xterm. And this is a Linux console where I can also like run um, CMD and I get then a Windows console. So I will try to tell you which console is which, but the one with the black background is Linux, otherwise it's Windows if there's uh, an image in the background. Cool, so uh, let's try to connect here. Here we go, and it's actually really a manual for SoCat. Uh, SoCat is like Netcat-like, it's basically an app which allows you to interact with uh, a service on the level of, um, well, of, um, on the level of, uh, um, the command, the, sorry, the console. So it's like uh, technically standard input and output is redirected to a socket. Uh, but socket is actually more powerful, powerful than netcat. But that doesn't matter. What we see here is a manual page, like man. And uh, you might know, and this is something you have to know or you have to find on like Google out, that man is kind of funny. Uh, if we, sorry, let's try to, I don't think socket works well with this. Let's try to press H and it will display the options. What can it do? So uh, yeah, let's display more. Yeah, this isn't working too well. I, I should probably use Telnet to connect to it. Anyway, um, I'm not sure it's actually here, but in case it isn't, that doesn't really matter because I remember that you can do um, same like in Vim, you can use the exclamation mark to run commands. So yeah. Use exclamation mark and then type a shell command and it will run. And that's, I think, like the normal behavior for man. So let's do on my PC man every, for example. And let's do this. Yeah, it's the same thing. So this is a normal manual. So let's see where's the flag. Um, the flag is probably in the home directory. So let's do ls la home. And there's the user more, so let's return and let's do ls. Sorry, I'm going to make the window a little big, bit bigger. Um, dash la home more. And uh, we have disable dmz something something here. Let's let's use the home more. Uh, no, 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 it's not more. D is more. Uh, what, 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 what? Oh, uh, not. I, I use the slash instead of an exclamation mark. I'm sorry. Cat home more. Here we go. Okay, the same bling DMZ using password and yeah, something catastrophic. This is the flag. So we're basically using a shell injection. This is what officially the vulnerability is called. Using shell injection. Um, well, I'm not sure that's a real shell injection. The shell injection is actually an injection. And this wasn't even an injection. This was just a feature of man. So whatever. We solved it. Another task is solved. So we have already for done. Now, let's go to this one, I guess, and then we'll, or maybe let's backtrack to this one and see what's this one um, instead. So I'm going to close this. I'm going to, I guess, ah, no, I guess this, uh, this directory isn't really going to have anything. Mm. Okay, let's go to this one. It's called floppy2. Uh, how did you know that was in that folder? Um, so it's like this. Usually uh, on a CTF, if you don't know where the flag is, the flag is going to be either in the top directory of a drive or it's going to be in the home directory. Or if it's not in the these two places, in the home directory or in the top directory of a, of a disk, then it's you basically have to find it. It's anywhere and you, you have to, I don't know, like run 
uh, our grep with ctf on the whole drive like apart from you know slash sys slash proc directories cool floppy too so it's uh, i guess it's experience is if you didn't know that which directory to look look at then that's okay if after the first time somebody tells you that you you know that <laughs> so it's this kind of a thing um i guess in ctfs you do have to get experience and you have to get quite a lot of knowledge that has to be, you know, in your head uh, or you have to know where to find something. So don't worry uh, if you if you missed that on the, on the CTF. Okay, uh, let's go to my download directory. Oh, this is, wait, what? Uh, there is no attachment. Looks like you found a way to open the file in the floppy, but what? Uh, but that uh, www.com file looks suspicious. Dive in and take another look. Okay, sure. So we need to copy this file into this folder. Let's do just that. And uh, I'm not, I cannot run it on my Windows because my Windows is 64-bit. If I would have a 32-bit Windows, I could run a com file on 64-bit. I cannot. Uh, this is due to changes in architecture, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that being said, I do have a bo DOSBox installed. So I can run DOSBox and see what's up. So DOSBox, okay. DOSBox is a DOS emulator, so it emulates both both the DOS operating system and the x86 um, CPU. I think at least the 16-bit and 32-bit. I'm not sure about the 64-bit, probably no. Uh, there. Okay, so that on um, mm, um, Okay, it says something weird, which is, that's fine. I'm going to Close those box and run it here. This is the actual debugger that you can debug an application with. So we get this window, but we also get this window. And this window, if I believe correctly, is the debugger, but it doesn't show anything yet. If I type on this window, uh, I'm sorry, I know the window is a little small. If I type debug and www.com, then the debugger basically stops execution of the application and I can go through it step by step but apart from that i can run the application in a in a disassembler i'm going to use ida uh, which is i guess a default tool you can use binary ninja you can use radari to whatever you like basically so this is i guess you yeah this is assembly and in all honesty when i was solving this challenge for the first time i did it like this hmm yeah it's garbage i'm not looking at this and I started just randomly going through that through the debugger. Um, I think you can run like help with enter to try to to know the comments, but uh, and there are some comments. But if I remember correctly, if I press uh, like F7 or F11, I don't remember. Uh, let's do just this DOS box debugger. Um, okay, keyboard shortcuts because what I need I need step into or stepping so I can run it. Instruction by instruction. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, FAQ. This is cool. This was something like debugger. No. Guide to DOSBox debugger. Oh, debugger key is perfect. Um, traces steps over. I want to trace. I want F11. So. I'm going to press F11 and start the code to execute and see basically what's going on here. Um, okay, so it XORs something, pushes something on the stack, XORs something again, pops something from the stack, blah, blah, blah. Um, okay, that's fine. Then it goes here and it goes, does some stuff again. Yeah, it increases, decreases, and how, how long is this loop, sorry? decrements ECX. Oh, it's only six here. It, it will this loop which I'm in this one is just going to go to go through six more iterations. So that's fine with me. I'm not analyzing this code as you can see. I'm just stepping and, and this is normally what I do at when I approach a reverse engineering challenge. I run it. I play around a bit. Maybe, maybe something will, you know, grab my attention, grab my focus. This is experience driven solving. It might not work if you just began with reverse engineering, but if uh, if you have some experience, then, then that's fine. Oh, this is another loop, and this loop is uh, a little longer. It's uh, 16, I think, iterations. And what it does, it basically... Oh, this is interesting, and this is what is catching my attention. It basically grabs something from memory. So this is 
SI is basically source index register, and this is the address. It grabs something, uh, one byte, no, two bytes. It grabs two bytes, like for example, these two bytes, and then it exhorts them with um, whatever is in DI in memory. So this is a decryption. Mm, Xoring, if you see XOR in a program, it's either zeroing a variable, and this is not zeroing a variable, or it's going to be decryption of some, or, or doing some weird stuff. So this is doing a weird stuff. I'm just going to go through it until the loop ends, blah, blah, blah. And then I'm going to take a look where did it store the stuff. Okay, okay. Yeah, one more iteration. Perfect. Now, it actually went to store the stuff on SS, that's the stack. And this is 016F. I want to, now this and this, the data overview is where I want to see that. Um, so how do I do that? I, I, I look at the guide. Mm. Blah, 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 debugger command. I want to display memory. Uh, D, data view, perfect. So I'm going to do D, then the segment, which is SS, the stack segment, and then uh, the offset, which is, um, at the end of the loop is this, but I, I actually want to display it a little aerial. But uh, okay, let's start with 016F. As you can see, it changed, and now I'm going to use page up. Oh, let's see, what do we have here? Is this a flag, perhaps? Perfect. So we have a flag. I just, just need to note it. Notes. So again, these challenges aren't really, if you know what you're doing, they are easy. Up to a point, when it gets harder. If um, I guess if a beginner would start to solve this challenge, it might be quite challenging, because in all honesty, debugging DOS isn't the most pleasant thing to do. Okay, good old DOS. That's the, that's the flag, let's see. Here we go, the challenge has been solved, has been marked as solved, so this is it. And uh, I'm going to kill it, but I'm going to try one more thing. After I solved it originally, and I solved it uh, more or less like this, uh, what the uh, what the folks about like from the beginners track told me is that uh, yeah, like uh, you can do another thing. You can do www.com and then redirect it to a file. And if you look at the file, it turns out that it actually displays the flag. But wait, what? We we did it right. We run it and it didn't display anything. So it turns out that what it really does, it writes the flag and then it does a carriage return to the beginning of a line and then overrides the flag with this long string. Yeah, so you could also do this, which in my case just, just didn't work. I, did, I didn't think about it. Cool, so now let's go to this challenge here. It's called security by obscurity. Uh, security by obscurity. Uh, yeah, there we go. I, I don't think that was correctly there. Reading the contents of a screenshot, you find that some guy named John created the firmware for the off hub router and stored it on an iDrop drive cloud server. Cloud share. You fetch it and find John. John, okay, um, this is something you have to know. John is a reference almost always if uh, this appears on the CTF. This is a reference to John the Ripper. John the Ripper. And John the Ripper is a really popular tool which allows you to do brute forcing of stuff like hashes and passwords and so on. So uh, this means we will probably have to do some brute forcing. So you fetch it and find the John packed the firmware with an unknown key. Yeah, totally brute forcing. Can you recover the package key? Let's see. Mm. So we download the attachment. Here we go. And it's this file, I guess. We copy it here. And this is a weird file. I'm going to look at it from a from exodatory. It's basically like pk um, then lzx, whatever. But pk means, okay, the zip file doesn't start at the beginning, but if you see pk letters at the beginning of a file, it's a pretty good indicator, it's a zip file. So this is probably a zip file. Why are there so many names? Let's, you know what, I'm going to do this. I'm going to run the Linux console, 
and I'm going to unzip it. So unzip password. What? Where? Unzip. Oh, um, it inflated a file which is called almost identity. So I guess there will be like these many, like, I don't know how many letters are here. At least the alphabet is at least once, maybe twice, maybe thrice here. So we have to unpack this 60 times at the beginning. Uh, there might be some funny way to cheat it. Let's let's like this. Let's do end. End is a tool which measures entropy. So let's do end and then this password thingy. And this isn't the end I'm looking for. Where is my end? Uh, oh, my end is on Windows. It, it measured the entropy, but I have another tool called end, which uh, I created for some time ago. And it creates a PNG file. Okay, so it seems there is some some compression there. I wanted to kind of cheat and maybe if it's just stored data and uncompressed data, maybe I can just carve it out, but it seems that's not the case, so we do have to unzip it somehow in a script. So let's do... Hmm, how do we do it? Uh, do I have 7-zip installed? I have 7-zip installed, so what can I do with 7-zip? Nah, you know, I usually use the 7-zip in, in Windows. Mm, okay, dash D is decomp decompress, and then I select the file. So let's see what happens. How does this tool work? Dash D, password, oh, okay. And it, uh, what, what did it do? Unknown suffix. I'm disappointed. If I do unzip, it actually works, so. Um, no, but unzip doesn't like tap completion. Okay, so it unzipped. I'm just going to do it manually. I'm just removing two letters and pressing enter. Sometimes it's not worth to automize something with a script. Oh, it says it cannot. Uh, okay. So we get to some point and to P letter... No, 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 no. It's uh, As you can see, the size is decreasing. So we get to letter A. Let's look at several letter A. Oh, that's actually a, a 7-zip. So I'm going to um, unpack it using Windows. And if I go here to 7-zip, I can do extract here. It, yeah, I know it's in Polish, but it says extract here. Uh, oh, wait, what happened? Uh, okay. So 7, extract here, and it says that it cannot open the file um, because something. Mm, I'm going to change the name to... Seriously, do I have to write a script for this? Okay, let's, let's do it like this. I'm going to change the name. And by the way, this is the part which I struggled the most on, on the CTF. P7zip-d and the 7zip, I think. Yeah. Here we go. Can, do I want to uh, overwrite it? No, wait. Do you want to replace the existing file? Yeah, sure. I want to replace it. And I got this file, which is a little... It's again a 7-zip. As you can see at the beginning. So I guess we have to do the, the same thing. But this time I'm going to be a little smarter about it, I guess. Um, wouldn't binwalk work, work? Okay, let's see what binwalk says about this. So binwalk, and this is, I think, the newest file. And it says that there's some XZ compressed data. Um, binwalk, I think, can extract known stuff. So it's binwalk-e, I think. And it has written some stuff here. So, okay, we got through some some things, uh, I guess. And we got to to this, um, to some exe files. Let's let's try to un extract this, whatever we got. Uh, no, I'm going to, you know, what I'm going to click, yeah. That's so like... What did we get here? This is a 7-zip, 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 and 7-zip. And I don't know which part of uh, of it it is. I guess this is the smaller the file is, the better. But I'm not fully sure about it. Uh, let's try to, I guess, extract this one. Oh, does it, is it, should it, it be XZ? I'm not fully sure about it. Is this the same file? Uh, no, it doesn't look like the same. Oh, so there's also like dash binwalk. I, I don't have too much experience with binwalk dash. 
E, it usually oh recursive, recursively scans extracted file. Thank you. So thank you for to Christian for actually teaching me this. Uh, you know how I did it on the original CTA while testing? I extracted it manually. Because yeah. Um, okay. No, 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 that was fine. Benwalk me password. Here we go. Oh, it seems there are some more files this, which it tries to output. That's cool. Hmm. That's kind of scary what it's doing. How many files is, am I going to get? Like a million? Okay, I didn't know there was this option, by the way. So binwalk dash capital M is for recursive, capital E is for... Uh, um, is there any zip file? I guess I'm looking for a zip file, right? Or whatever. No, it's not clear what I'm looking for. Let's see what's here. Yeah, I have really a lot of files now. So let's do it like this. I'm going to enter this directory, whatever it's called. And now I'm going to do find dot. Find the dot will list all the files. And I'm going to do file on each of these. And I'm going to dump it to like notes.txt. So I will be able to review all the files which are here. And there seems to be quite a lot of files. Yeah, exe, exe, exe. Is there only exe here? Uh, oh, there's some bz2 at also. I'm ignoring the directory, just looking around. Mm. So again, I'm, I'm not really sure which file it is in the end, uh, but what I can do is I can actually, I know that um, neither bz2 nor xz can actually be have a password. I know that for a fact. Um, I also know that um, like .rar, .7zip or .zip can have a password. So this means that if I have to crack a key, I I do like all these files which are xz compressed data or bzip2 compressed data or the directory, these are like not, not the things I, I care about. So I can do notes and now I can do grep-v and look for anything which is not xz. And I get quite a lot of resu results, let's do it again. I can also do grep-v uh, bzip2 and uh, oh, the dash v, sorry. Dash v is like, do not show me it. And I can do grab dash v um, directory. Yeah, here we go. And nothing is left. So, yeah, I'm not really sure about this method. Uh, what can we do from here then? I guess we can grab the smallest file and try to extract it anyway. So, I'm going to try to like remove this. Okay, and I'm going to try to extract it, and then we'll go from here manually. So, it's, uh, it cannot extract it. So, can it extract this one? No, there's an error. It can ex oh, it can extract it after. Uh, which file is smaller? This one is smaller. So, okay. Let's extract it here. Okay, this actually worked. So, 7, extract, here we go. Yeah, sometimes the manual way is the fastest anyway. So seven extract, seven extract, seven extract. The file is getting smaller. It will take 10 minutes if you want to, to have a break. This is the proper time to do it. Uh, seven, oh wait, oh, what, oh. Yeah, uh, I know it might look funny, but in all honesty, on some CTFs, it's just faster to do some stuff manually than look for the perfect script, the perfect solution. As you can see, I, I'm like at four kilobytes now, three kilobytes, three and a half kilobytes, so I'm getting there. Mm, wait. Again. 
again. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 1000. So uh, we, we're pretty close. I mean, you cannot have too much stuff in 1000. Oh, wait. Uh, it cannot extract it. What's up? I'm going to grab this file and go all the way up. Here we go, and I'm going to create a new directory called uh, whatever. And I'm going to copy this file here, I'm going to rename it to 51. Let's see what's the file. Um, busy, busy at uh, the beginning means busy too. I can again use 7-zip to extract it. Again. And again. And again. Uh, okay. Like right, 400 bytes. This, how how many layers does this have? It cannot. There cannot be too many more layers. Seriously. Mm. Yeah. So about the extraction tool, the way binlock wor works is it actually doesn't understand the concept of the end of a file. It basically carves out the part from the beginning where it found the magic matching. And then it uh, grabs stuff to the end of a file, so you do have to take that into consideration, by the way. So that's to answer one of the questions from the chat. Okay. Mm. Oh, it wants a password. We're there. Yes. Now we can actually get... Yeah, the password is here. So what kind of a... But uh, is zero size, so... It's PK. It's a zip. Hello zip. So um, pass wd dot zip. Uh, yeah, yeah, keep whatever. And I'm going to grab this file. I'm going to go all the way to the top. Here we go. And now I'm going to remove everything apart from the uh, from the zip file because I don't need it anymore. Goodbye. Perfect. Now we need to, I guess, set up John the Riper to do um, or do this. I have done the wrapper actually downloaded, and uh, so if I do go to free open source software, then John. Oh, yeah, what's it? Uh, crap. Okay. Uh, oh, it's capital letters. Okay, perfect. And uh, this is, by the way, the Jumbo version of John Viper. Jumbo version is a community effort, I think, to implement more kinds of brute forcing to John Viper. So I do have it installed. No, I don't have it installed. I have it compiled. Mm. And there is... Uh, uh, to crack a zip file, you basically have to first run this zip to John. So zip to John. Uh, yeah, and your zip file. Where's my zip file? It's on uh, this directory. This is obviously a Windows directory, so I cannot use this. I need to do this. And whatever. So, yeah. And uh, it gives us a hash, and this this is the hash which we need to feed to John the Riper. So I'm going to do uh, pass wd dot txt, and I'm going to pass pass this hash here, and now we are going to run john the riper on it so hello john and do run it on sorry this uh, oops this path dot txt and uh, mm, using loaded one hash uh, no password left to crack uh, what why is there no password left to crack Where is this one password? What are you talking about? Uh, maybe it takes input at standard input, I don't know. How do you use John to crack a zip file? John zip file. Usually I don't do brute forcing on zip files because there is a, a known plain text attack. Uh, okay, type John the Riper, do this, uh, then do word list and then you do the hash which is fine it should just work um it doesn't work hmm. 
Let's do cannabis. Okay, you know what? I'm going to do this. History grab John. Here we go. And we do. How did I run it? Final. No, I, I just run it like this. So maybe I copy pasted something wrong. So let's do this again. And let's hash.txt. And let's run uh, John again on hash.txt. I need a word list or a single? Okay, let's try single, single. As you can see in my history, it did work before. Huh. That's pretty weird. Why doesn't it seem to work? Maybe it doesn't have... No, this path should be fine, right? I, I, uh, do, uh, do I have to have dash show? Okay, one password. Okay, no, 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 it, it, it's here. Yeah, thank you for dash show. So that means it actually updated the file. No, it didn't update it. That's weird. I wonder why word usually outputs the password. I'm pretty sure when I did it previously, it did output the password. But there is, yeah, this is the password. So here we go. Uh, this was probably the most boring task for you to watch. Um, let's see, ASDF, and we got it. So, per perfect. Uh, okay, okay, and let's put it. Okay. Oh, it actually has the files, the, oh, it act okay, so this is a good explanation from Christian uh, and from Radu. If you cracked it before, it does not crack it again, and John actually saves all the cracked stuff in the pod file. I did mention it, but I did test this thing, so I guess that's, that's the reason. It already had it in the cache, so it didn't um, want to show it again. Well, okay, that's fair enough, but we got it in the end, that's, uh, that's probably fine. So let's move to uh, this one. JS safe, no, not this one, this one, uh, no, because so admin UI is actually these three challenges is like uh, you do them one after the other. So let's do let's start with this one. I said no to this one because I remember this one. This one is one of the hardest challenges uh, here for beginners, I think. But okay, let's do it now. JS save, and we can download something. Well, it's definitely the nineties using what was found in the mysterious. .ico file, you extracted the driver from the aluminum key hardware password storage device. Let's see what it has. And it seems it has had, well, this thing, which I just downloaded, which is an HTML file. So yeah, JS save. Let's open it. And uh, this doesn't look like the 90s. Um, this looks like modern CSS and JavaScript and whatnot and the WebGL maybe. Let's uh, open the file to see the code. And uh, well, we, it's obvious, we, we have to pipe, type some password here and it will probably tell us that, yeah, like, um, do enter the correct password. Advertisement, looking for handcrafted browser-based virtual safe to store your most interesting secrets. Look no further, we have found it. You can order your own by sending an email to blah, 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 example.com. Uh, Example.com is like 555 telephone number in the movies. It doesn't exist. Uh, when ordering, please specify the password you'd like to use to open and close the safe. And <laughs> what? When or ordering the safe, we have to specify the password. Okay, I, I already love it. And the content you'd like to store. Uh, we'll handcraft a unique safe just for you. That only works with your password of choice and contains your secret. We promised we won't pick uh, when handling the data. Right. Uh, I'm not going to order a save from them. Okay, this is, I guess, CSS, which does the magical rotation over the spinning cube. That's, that's fancy. I love it. Then we have an asynchronous function. Okay, this isn't the 90s. This is modern JavaScript. To do, check if they can use Google to get the password once they understand how this works. And we have this, and this looks like a text array which actually has a lot of um, 
non-ASCII characters like Unicode and coded characters, and then there's something blah blah blah, but we don't care about it. Uh, because we are not looking at the password, at the function X right now, we will look at it later. Firstly, we need to understand what's the order, and I, I, I would like to go from the, let's call it the bottom or the top, however you want to call it, basically from um, the function which starts the whole program. And this is, this is not, this is just a function declaration, but the function is not called at the end, so it may be called here, and uh, there's nothing else, nothing more here apart this. So that's good. Let's look what we have here. We have an AES uh, CBC mode uh, something, like a secret. Uh, AES is uh, it's a modern cipher, which is uh, safe. It's, it's a good cipher. So yeah, with, without getting the key, we are not decrypting this. If it's really this, because you know this might be a red herring. This might be just to. It's actually like Caesar cipher or something, but they put this string here to look really good, uh, like good security. But we have a secret, and I, I guess this is IV. Yeah, this is IV. So this is uh, to decrypt the CBC AES CBC content. You need two things. You need the initialization vector, which is known. This is plain text, and you need the secret. And I guess this is the secret. Uh, the secret has to be um, a mul the size of a secret has to be a multiplier of sixteen, but that doesn't matter because we're not going to crack AES today. Then we have an open safe function, and as you can see, if we put something in, yeah, if we put something in the input, this function is getting called. So let's see what's going on here. Uh, Keyhole disabled true. I have no idea what's this. Then the password. The password has to match the flag. So I guess it has to be a CTF at the beginning, CTF at the end, and then we have this stuff. If no password is given, then uh, or blah blah blah, or if uh, whatever returns the X function, the function we saw before, which I'm going to get back to in a second, it goes. Oh, it it basically grabs this only only this part. So we have to guess the part which is in the bracket. This is what the one tells us here, I guess. So whatever we give it as the input, it goes to the X function and the function probably returns true or false depending on if it wants us to go away of, or if we actually have access. Um, so yeah, uh, depending on what's the actual result, it either does denied or granted on the axis. And if the access is granted, it doesn't return, it returns only in this case. It decrypts the, what does it do? It does SHA of whatever we have given it. And uh, and it decrypts the, the, the secret, I guess. It imports it and then decrypts it. And then decodes it and then it, I guess, shows it, whatever, whatever the secret is. So yeah, we have to get the flag and the flag will open the safe. This is basically what we, what we have to do. So, um, yeah. We now have to look at this small but scary looking function. Um, so we have the code, something which is the code, and this is the code. Uh, I don't know, is the code as in, you know, encoding, meaning a, a, a cipher text? Or is it code as in bytecode? And this is what we will have to figure out. Then we have the environment, the env. And the env is actually just a couple of things. It's, it's an object and or like if you think in Python, that's a dictionary. If you think in C++, that's a map. If you think in PHP, that's an array. But in JavaScript, it's an object, which has these keys, A, B, C, D, up to H. And uh, it does something. I don't know what it does. But uh, there are some, this is a function call. This is the Lambda function in, in, in modern JavaScript. So there is a function which is not named. It takes two arguments and it returns whatever is the result of X or um, with y index. So I guess x is supposed to be an array or an object and y is supposed to be an index. Then we have a call to a function constructor with um, x and y. So I guess this is going to create some functions um, while this gets executed. Um, no, well, called when, when it gets called. And x and y, I don't know what, what this is supposed to be. Probably the body of a function, maybe the name of a function, I don't know. Then this is just adding like calling the C function is just adding two, two values. Calling the D function is getting a string from code. So if we 
put here, for example, 40, 41, OX41, like hexadecimal, we get a capital letter A, uh, basically. But this is Unicode, you, you need to remember it's Unicode. Then E and F are just integers, so it's H, and this G is quite interesting. It's text encoder encode password. I have absolutely no idea what the text encoder is, but it's going to encode our password. What is text encoder? Um, oh, I wanted to press F12 here, but this doesn't make too much self sense. I'm pressing F12 here to get to console. This is a JavaScript console, which I can use. Uh, can I make it bigger? I can make it bigger, which is amazing. So uh, let's, let's see what this does. Encode, and I'm going to give it some random string. Oh, it kind of works. It, uh, well, it gives us an array. Yeah, it's basically like if, if you think in Python, that's the same as a byte array run on, on a string. It gives us the ASCII or Unicode codes of this. So we get an array with Unicode codes and that's it. Now let's look at this main loop. The main loop is uh, actually incrementing in chunks of four. So if we look at this again, we have to split it by four. Now, I guess you can already see a pattern here, right? The, like the letter C, for example, is on the second place always for some reason. And here again, the second place. So, okay, this is getting interesting. Then, um, it, yeah, it grabs the for a substring, it grabs the code from the position I. So it gets uh, only four characters, Unicode characters, and it extracts them into um, this thing, like LHS, whatever that is, FN, I guess is function, and argument one and argument two. So this starts to look like a virtual machine. If you're not familiar with virtu virtual machine, do look at my some previous live streams I have on virtual machines, but um, it's basically a simple computer which is programmed by the bytecode upver and which does something, and what does it do? Um, it tries to run what Oh, the, the function. So for example, if we, I, I did mention that the second character is C, right? So it selects the function C, like this function. And uh, what would we have? It's ICFF. And then it grabs the argument. So this is F, this is F. And F, as we can see, it's one actually. So it puts one here, one here, and then, um, selects the addition function from, from this array, so the C function, and it uh, saves into the environment, into the object, LF, as a, what was it? I at the beginning, right? So it's just does like I is equal to F plus F, basically. So, well, in, in this case, right, for, for the C function. And for other functions, it might do different thing. If this doesn't work and actually backfires, then it tries to create a, do the same, but assume that uh, the, the selected function is actually a constructor. It's not a function, it's a constructor of a class. So it's, it's pretty similar, we can ignore it. And then if it's an instance of a promise, uh, so it's a, if it's an asynchronous call, a call which, um, like if, um, it's like this, you run code normally like one after the other, but then there are some functions which are as asynchronous, which means that they start when you call them, but they run in the background and your code just goes to the next and they still are running in the background. So, um, and they return a promise, basically an object which you can use to know where, when these functions running in the background are finished and have the result ready for you. Uh, and this await basically awaits for the result to be ready and returns the result. So if, if for some reason this is an asynchronous function, then it actually waits for the results and puts the result here as well. So this is just to make sure that the function result ends up in the environment basically the same way as uh, happened here. This is just to ensure that this line or this, uh, the idea behind this line is always executed. And then it, oh, perfect. And it returns uh, if, h is, uh, if h is equal to zero, uh, this um, exclamation mark at the beginning means not h, then it returns true. So if h is zero, then it will return true. If h is non-zero, then it will return false. And we want it to return, uh, we want it to return true because if it, returned, it returns false, it just, yeah, access denied. Cool, so well, how do we start? Um, well, we basically display the environment. Um, at each moment. So I'm going to add logging here, console log and uh, blah, 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 I, okay. And now let's display the environment, console log and um, 
just the whole environment. And I'm going to, uh, let's maybe do this, reload this page, type ASDF, press enter. Oh, uh, sorry, I cannot play, press uh, ASDF, I have to do this and press enter. And it, as you can see, it executes, but so what we know at the beginning, at the beginning we knew that uh, this is adding one plus one and puts it in the I register, right? So uh, let's see if after the first run, we actually get in the I register, we get, whoa, what, what is this doing here? There is something wrong. And yeah, and this is also a bug, which I'm pretty sure everyone who tried to solve this encountered. Uh, the problem here is that, um, the console logging works like this. You pass it a reference to an object, um, which I did here, and it doesn't immediately display it. It saves the environment, the, the reference to that object somewhere, and uh, when it has time, it actually takes that reference and starts displaying the object, which means if that object was modified in the meantime, it displays the most newer version. And we don't want the most newer version, we want the version exactly at this time. Which means that uh, we can do this, we can do... Um, we, we have to clone it, we have to copy this, make a copy of the environment. And in JavaScript, uh, I guess you can Google it out, like uh, JavaScript copy object, like shallow copy it's called. How do I correctly clone an object? And yeah, use object assign. So we can do object assign and then to which object, and yeah. And this basically returns an object, which I guess is uh, a, a cloned object. So this is fine. Um, yeah, and now we can, oh, so on the chat you are ch uh, r r wondering why I'm not using the, the debugger. And uh, it's because um, I prefer to actually do tracing instead of debugging. That's my personal preference. You might prefer to use the debugger. I prefer to use tracing. That's just it. Like, it's a personal preference. Okay, CTF, ASDF, and let's see now if it works correctly. So going here, this is we have, uh, we, we should start displaying function and so on here, but uh, let's just see here. As you can see, it doesn't display the, the whole alphabet anymore. I did appear here and I is equal to two, so our understanding is correct of what happened. Now let's do, let's add some more stuff here. We're going to add, um, you know what, I'm going to add something else. I'm going to here put, no, I'm going to move this here. And here I'm going to put the function and the arguments. Arc1 and arc2. And I'm also going to put the environment of those arguments. Like, uh, because the argument is a register, a, a variable within the environment, but we want the content of that register or the content of that variable, which means, yeah, we want both the register and the content of it and the name of the function. Um, yeah, cool. Let's rerun it. Uh, so yeah, CTF, ASDF, perfect. Now, what we know is that uh, we are looking for the H, uh, this one. So let's, I, I'm also going to do something more. I'm going to output the h uh, environment uh, register here, so env.h and rerun it, and I'm going to see when it starts to change, because I absolutely do not care about when it's not changing. So, okay, so it's 256. As you can see at the beginning it's zero, so let's look at the point where this actually was uh, uh, not 255. Blah, 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 something, something, blah, blah, blah. Uh, still, oh, wait, 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 here's zero. Zero, 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 and oh, and here it changed for the first time ever. So what happened that led to its changing? Um, here we have, um, I have absolutely no idea what letter is this. I'm sorry, I don't know. Um, but this function is called, so is this the function? No, yeah, no, yes, yeah, yeah, A, A is the function, so A function is called, and these are the arguments, and I guess the first argument is some array. This array looks interesting, what are you, dear array? And then, um, and then we also should uh, look at F, and F is 22. 
so it got 22 and it's doing something. I have no idea what it's doing. Let's see what the function a is. Function a is, is just like grab. So I guess it grabs um, the first argument from this. So I guess it grabs this like from the array and then and then why, why, why does it change to h? I don't get it. Uh, all right, let's let's look above because this 22 is appearing here, right? And here is appearing something else. So what's going on here? Like j, what is j? j is free. Okay, j is free. Are there any other interesting stuff here? Just numbers, a lot of numbers, some return constructor. Okay, this is this is starting to be interesting. There's some function here. Okay, next some other function. Oh, this is interesting. As you can see, this is XOR. So the code created at some point an XOR function. And here it created, I don't know if you can see it, let, let me scroll it, an OR function. Now, um, this is again, you could probably analyze it, but I, I kind of know already by these two functions, by seeing these two functions only, what's going on. And what's going on is actually it's uh, doing um, a constant time comparison. So in cryptography, it's sometimes useful to be able to compare two strings, which are of the same uh, length, uh, using constant time. So do not exit at the first mismatching character. Instead, go through all of them and then say whether yeah, they are identical or not. And the way you do it is you take one string and the other string and XOR all the characters, like XOR between them, and then add it to some other register. For example, XORing this with this and this ORing it with a register which is at the beginning zero. Now, if two things are identical, if two characters are identical in the same string, then the result of XORing two identical characters or two identical numbers is zero. That's how XOR works, it's zero. Therefore, if you zero, uh, zero with zero is also zero. If they would mismatch at any point, a bit would be set or some bits would be set and like for example 22. And uh, then if you XOR zero with 22, it's 22. If you then like find, I don't know, one, then it's uh, 23. It starts to be 23. So the OR operation, this operation is cumulative. It will be gathering bits and it will always be setting bits. It will never be um, unsetting bits if you start to doing or after an or after an or to the same register. So yeah, what's going on here is just like compares um, one string with uh, with another string using XOR and using uh, the or operand in constant time comparison. So this is something you you have to either figure out or know, but uh, well, or learn, this is, you know, is again, this experience, right? And there's also some cryptography going on here. So it's calculating probably, and this is a, this is an educated guess, but it's calculating SHA 256 of what we enter, and then it compares it with some hash, which means that in one of these arrays, are they this array or the other array we saw before? There was another array or wasn't there? No, there wasn't. So uh, yeah, I guess, uh, um, this might be an array which contains either the hash of what we've entered or the hash of which it's going to compare to. And this is quite uh, quite interesting, isn't it? Mm, I guess this is what we've entered. But uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's basically copy this. So I'm going to copy this, this array. Oh, come on, let's just, let's just, let me just copy it. I'm going to create a notes file again. Here we go. And I'm going to, to take it to Python. I'm going to change this into a byte array and I'm going to calculate, uh, oops, 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 oops. And I'm going to calculate uh, a shot. No, no, I'm going to just display this, I guess. Sorry, uh, I don't have to calculate the hash of it. Okay, I guess Windows console is enough for me. So Python ISDF. Byte uh, array, sorry, that's a typo, that's byte array, array, okay, here we go. Uh, but that was not a good idea. Let's convert it to a string and convert the string to an uh, code hex. But it's, um, sorry, that's, that's not a function, here we go. Okay, and let's look in, in Google, what, what is this? Here we go, and it's uh, SDF. 
Yeah, a SDF is uh, what I entered, right? So this is our hash. Now, this means that it's really, really, really interesting. What is it being compared with? So as you, you can see, let's maybe uh, collapse this. This is taken from our hash again, right? From the ASDF hash. Yeah, this is this. Where did it get the this from? And I actually don't care where did it get it from. What I want to know is like, what are the other numbers? So it's like, it's this number, then it's this number. Um, yeah, let's see. 9194, so it's this number, 96, and so on. So if we start noting down these numbers, these, this should be quite quite interesting for us. Uh, so yeah, but I'm not going to note it by hand, I'm going to actually like uh, change this code. So let's do var a equals like, I don't know, is this an array in JavaScript? A equals to whatever, yeah, it's an array. Can I do now a push? SDF or like one. Okay, yeah, that works. Okay. Sorry, my JavaScript is a little rusty. So I guess the function is going to have to be this. So um, if the function is equals to, to this, and th this is not a w, this is some weird Unicode character then I want you to add like push to my array uh, what the second argument right because the first argument is uh, no wait mm, I want the well what was going on here I'm lost uh, this is the first argument the second argument so this is the first argument this is the second argument so I'm going to grab the first argument but uh, index one so this is the first argument and index, uh, sorry, index zero. No, 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 index one, I, I am saying it correctly. And at the end, I'm going to console log a, log a. What happens if you change the length of your password? Uh, it should be, it shouldn't do anything else because if it's calculating the hash, then, then I already know there is no length check because it gets to a length calculation. And I also know there are no jumps here and I isn't in the environment. So there are going to be no, no comparison functions probably uh, apart from this constant time comparison, of course. Okay, so let's do this. So the length of what I enter shouldn't matter in this case, but it's a good thing to check and that's, uh, that's what I agree with. Okay, so let's uh, let me grab this. I do not care about this anymore. I care about this. And we get another hash and I'm going to Google this other hash. And uh, yeah, it is uh, in some, oh, we, we can see it here already, it's password. Yeah, this doesn't work, let's use this one. Okay, I'm going to look for our hash. Here we go, hello. So is this the correct password? Let's see if it's the correct password by entering it into here. Yeah, so I'm going to refresh it. CTF, password, access granted, perfect, task completed. Click, let's just enter the flag. Um, and it gives actually some, some URL here, router web. Uh, I guess we're going to go over in, in a second anyway. So first thing to enter the flag. Okay, and I'm going to copy uh, this for some reason. Yeah. So yeah, and uh, this is basically also how I originally solved it. Basically the same way. I didn't dig too much into it. Um, I guess if you're new to virtual machines or reverse engineering, you might want to dig a little more into it. But uh, basically what tipped me off is again the XOR function and the OR function. I saw them and I was like, yeah, constant time comparison, easy, done. Mm. Cool, but uh, again, I recognize that if you're new to this, you might have to analyze it a little deeper to get into uh, to, to to understand what's going on. There. Okay, mm. cool. So we have this done. Now we have this one left, but uh, I would actually like to do this one before we start to get into the ponings. Firmware is going to be our next one. 
Okay. Oh, sorry. After unpacking the firmware archive, you now have a binary in which to go hunting. It's now time to walk around the firmware and see if you can find anything. Okay. I'm happy to always walk around the firmware and find stuff. It's, uh, okay, X4, mm, let's decompress it. So this is a file system image. I'm pretty sure I already mentioned that binwalk might be a good tool, but before using binwalk, I'm just going to, uh, okay, I'm going to open this, and I'm going to do CTF. Ah, uh, no, <laughs> it's not so easy. Sometimes it, it might have worked. I just open, you know, a random hex editor and look for the CTF image. Uh, sorry, sorry, CTF uh, and the opening curly brackets. Instead, I have to, I guess, uh, mount it. So I have it noted where, how to mount it. I always forget it. So I go comments to forget on my blog and uh, mount Linux partition, the first thing. And this, I already have a partition. I don't have a disk image, so I can ignore this and I can just do sudo mount uh, dash o loop offset. I can ignore it because again, this is a partition image. It's not a disk image. And then just it, so just dash o loop. Mm, okay, so let's launch, launch a Linux console. And sudo mount dash o loop. And now challenge, and I created a directory called x here. Okay, password. Here we go. And uh, yeah, and let's enter the X directory. And this is a file system. Oh, wow, well, this was fast. Media backdoor password. Let's just copy it uh, upstairs. Uh, this is why I like doing LA, like show all even the hidden files. Okay, let's extract it, and we get. Oh, uh, look, the password, the flag. I know this FS. Perfect. Done. So let's enter it, click, okay. So that's easy, let's just unmount it, sudo so umount x, and, and that's it. Perfect, now um, let's go with this one. Router UI, oh, this is I guess the, the URL we found in the previous challenge. Router UI. Uh, okay. <laughs> Whoa, was the audio stream off while I typed, uh, when he typed his password? Yes, it was off. There, there is some research that you can actually either map the keyboard sounds, like each key makes a unique sound, and you can map it uh, to, you know, sound to key, or there is some other research that um, is, uh, is, it's said that if you have the time between typings, you can map which keys were pressed based on how fingers move, like how much time it takes a finger to move. And I think that wasn't ever reproduced outside of a laboratory, but I'm not taking chances. Uh, okay. So, uh, Shaku got a link to a write-up on uh, JS Safe, which is different than what I did. So, Shaku, if you could actually pass that link around the channels, that would be, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, router, oh sorry, uh, it's a web UI. So let's go here. Uh, um, okay, perfect. SDF, SDF. Sign in, wrong credentials. Okay, this is funny. Uh, I'm going to read the description. Using the domain found on the uh, hardened aluminum key, you make your way onto the offline, uh, sorry, off hub router, a, rev a revolutionary device that simplifies your life. You're at the UI page, but attempting to brute force the password fails miserably. If we could find an XSS on the page, um, then we could use it to steal the root user session token. In case you find something, try to send an email to wintermuted at googlegroups.com. If you claim your link includes cat pictures, I'm sure wintermuted will click it. I hope Chrome XSS filter will not block you. Really, there is a Chrome XSS filter. Uh, right, um, I struggled with the XSS filter a little. I struggled with finding HTTPS uh, server a lot. Thankfully, I have HTTPS on my server from today. Uh, so I'm going to, to connect to my server because it's going to be needed. And I will be using my, uh, yeah, my server. 
to to grab the password. So, okay. Mm, okay. So please bear with me. I am going to need to type another password. So. Mm. Yeah, right back. Okay. Uh, fuck. Uh, this is, yeah, no, not the correct place to to put my password. I think I am going to have to change it later on. Uh, okay, uh, the right. Hmm. No, it wasn't on chat, by the way, thankfully. Hmm. I guess it is in my history now on my server. I will have to reset it. Please do not hack my server because you'll then get my password. Oh, wait, you, if you hack my server, you don't care for it anymore. So, yeah, whatever. Okay, uh, var block. Hmm. I actually, I, I will show you what I'm looking for in a second. So, uh, just bear with me. Okay, this this will be fine. This will do. Mm. Okay, so this is on my server, <laughs> a file called ASDF ASDF. Let's just go here. And wh what it does, it actually writes um, the request which I sent to it into a file in the temp directory, and it does something. But that something is not really what I what I care about, so I can remove it. Okay, now, um, yeah, so if I enter this on my blog, mm, https asdfasdf.php, it doesn't display anything, but it's supposed to um, write to a file. Yeah, here we go. So it written some stuff into, into the file, uh, Hopefully nothing super interesting. Uh, yeah, whatever. Cool. Uh, you know what? I'm going to do one more thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Give me a second. Okay. Okay, uh, here we are. Let's try it now. Okay, perfect. Um, now I guess we can... Yeah, we, we, now we have everything we need to do a login, because what I want to do is uh, I want to exploit an XSS. And the XSS, after I exfiltrate the token, I have to exfiltrate it somewhere. And that somewhere has to have an HTTPS. Because we know, we don't know, but it's actually true what I know and what I struggled on during the, the actual uh, testing, is that the router is using HTTPS. It's also using HTTP, but there is no session token on the HTTP. Now, due to the way how uh, modern browsers tell you not to... Um, tell you not to basically, um, well, load JavaScript scripts from HTTP, then, uh, well, that means that uh, I cannot have my script that I'm going to inject on HTTP, I have to have it on HTTPS. So, so yeah, this is why, and, and then I need to send the password of using HTTPS too. So, yeah, that's why all the struggle with HTTPS. You can use, you know, Let's Encrypt, or you can use something called XSS Hunter, I believe, which is really, really amazing as well here, but I'm not going uh, to use it today. This is basically a, a site which is, uh, it has automated everything I'm going to do. To do. Uh, cool. So we know, now know we have an XSS, and whatever we typed is gets, gets displayed here, and it's actually served with, uh, as HTML. So, and uh, we can check it for, I guess, uh, h1 is the Let's look at inverse injection and inverse injection. Let's do a standard. I need a notes document. 
Let's do a standard script something. So script document domain. No, script other one. One, okay, script. Here we go. Uh, okay, SDF. And it says, oops, blocked. And well, we know from the description that we actually need to bypass the XSS auditor. And um, I'm going to tell you how to do it, but uh, you can easily find it on the on the internet. So this is basically what I did during testing. I went to look all the different ways to bypass Chrome, um, um, yeah, Chrome Auditor. And what you have to do in this case is you have to uh, sorry. Let's go back here. ASDF, ASDF. You basically have to use this character, which is here, which are double slash, and you have to use it to groom to get the script from somewhere else. So I have to do like SRC and this will be my user. And then the two slashes are going to be put here and whatever else is the password is going to be put here. So I don't have to put this, I can just do, um, what I want to achieve is basically like unveil code range, PL, and then the uh, ASDF, ASDF. Mm, by the way, I'm, I'm logging way too much here. So if you don't need this, I need good. This and yeah, just okay. But I do want to, to append it to the file. Let's, let's do maybe this. Uh, so okay, let's run it. And now I want just to append to it. Here we go. Okay. Now um, this basically means that I need to. Uh, oh, I, I I want to go to ASDF ASDF PHP. So this is, I don't need this, I need this, and I need to close the tag. And I hope this will actually bypass the, the filter. Uh, oops, let's try it. So let's go here. And again, you can Google it. So yeah, it, uh, it didn't complain, the auditor didn't complain. If you look at the source code, it actually did try to fetch my script. And it probably there's an error in the console that yeah, the server said that yeah, like no, which uh, which is weird. So I didn't say no, ASDF, ASDF. Uh, I don't know, I'm going to say ASDF. Uh, let's actually do alert one just for the, for the fun of it. And let's uh, try it. Wait, yeah. Oh, wait, uh, here. Yeah, yeah, so it works, right? It uh, gets my script, and my script does alert one, and it gets displayed. So that's fine. Now, what I want to do is I want to actually steal the cookies. So I want to do, um, well, to swipe the cookies, you basically need uh, to send them somewhere. And there are several ways to do it. And uh, well, what I'm going to do, I guess, is going to be. Um, I'm going to create an image tag. This is what I usually do. So let's do the document write and create an image tag, um, image src. And uh, you know what I'm going to do? This. And yeah, it's basically like the same asdf asdf.php. I wanted to, oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, I need to pass it the full domain. So let's do it like this. Bam, flag, or like session token actually, but because that's not going to be the flag. And now in JavaScript, I need to, uh, wait, oh, I need to concatenate this with, uh, it's, it's losing coloring, well, whatever. I need to concatenate it with uh, document.cookie, which is the place where the cookie is stored. So if we go to here, open the console and type document.cookie, here we go. Um, yeah, there's no uh, there's no cookie for me, but there will be for the admin. At least I hope there will be a cookie for the admin. So it will send the cookie for me if I actually do this. Yeah, it will create an image. Let's retry it. Yeah. Okay. And there is the image. And if you we look at the source code again. Uh, oh, the, the image is not here because the image has been the image has been dynamically added to it, which means I have to open the console and look at the elements, and the image will be here. And it actually did say the session is equals to to nothing, to empty. Let's I guess we can cut the file, and uh, yeah, 
mm, the cat is nothing. I, I guess this is from uh, from uh, you folks from from the chat. Cool. So now I have almost everything to get the cookie to get the cookie, but I don't have the thing which I need to send to the link to which I need to send here. And I cannot actually send the link either because this form is over um, over post. So I need to create a form myself. So yeah, let's create a form. Um, so what I'm going to do, I guess, is I'm going to no, wait. Not in notes here. I'm going to um, do something like this. Uh, I'm wondering how to do it. Okay, I, I'm just going to write HTML code here. I guess I'm going to do this. Uh, wait, wait, wait. This because this opens a comment in JavaScript, and I'm going to write HTML here because this this is fine. This is a so-called uh, polyglot file, which is both JavaScript at the same time as is HTML. And uh, I guess I can do it because why not? Now I can create the form. I'm not going to create the form. I'm going to swipe it from here. Uh, thank you for the form. Perfect. Now the form is going to contain the placeholder. No, no, no. I don't need this. I don't need this. I don't need this. I need this, and I need to preset my value. I don't need this. I totally don't not need this. I need action to actually be able to send the form to the proper place, and the proper place is this login URL. So here we go. Okay. Now I do need to set the proper value as I mentioned. So value equals. Now the value needs to be HTML entities encoded. So uh, HTML entities encoder online. Uh, yeah, it looks perfect. And let's put it here. This is HTML encoded. And this is again something you you well you you have to know from experience, I guess. But it's supposed to be encoded like this. It won't work otherwise because it would be. Um, um, you know, like interpret it as uh, um, as HTML code instead of uh, escaped, and it needs to be escaped because it needs to be sent there. So this is fine. Now I need to make a JavaScript which is going to submit this. So I do Java wait wait script, and I need script as well. And uh, there's a funny way to do it. So if you're here, um, there is something like document dot forms forms. And this is an array of forms, so if I select the first form, I can do submit on it. Yeah, and it just sends the form. So this is exactly what I want to do. So document submit, uh, sorry, forms of zero submit. So this is what's going to happen. If you enter this page, right, you will get. Um, well, display the string, but doesn't matter at all. When display the form, the form is already pre-filled with proper values, and uh, then the, the form is going to be submitted to this URL, and it's going to exploit the XSS, and the XSS will actually reload this page again, but in the context of uh, JavaScript, right? So it gets reloaded in the context of JavaScript, and, uh, and, and this might actually not work after all, but uh, we'll figure it out in a second. So you know what? I'm going to do one more thing here. Mm. Here I'm going to add uh, JS equals one. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, this is now better. JS equals one, and let's do it like this. Uh, let's not not do a uh, not do it like this again. Because okay, so what I'm going after is that Chrome will complain that hey, there's a JavaScript, and the JavaScript was sent with text HTML or sub with that. Is it really JavaScript? I'm not going to run it. Uh, so what we need is we need actually to do application JavaScript for JavaScript and application and, and sorry and this for for not JavaScript. So um, if the oh, actually I could leave it. Um, sorry, I can leave this the comment here, and this will work still. But I need to change the header depending on whether but JS is equal to one or not. So if um, get JS is equals to one, it's actually set. If it's set, get JS. And uh, oops, sorry. And it's equals to one. Then I do um, header content type application JavaScript. I think that's was the correct mime type. Mime JavaScript. Yeah, text JavaScript application JavaScript both are fine. So that's that's okay. 
Okay, and otherwise uh, I need to have it as... Uh, sorry. Oh, come on. Oh, that's... Uh, that's what you get for not using Vim, Vim for, for a while. I need text HTML. Text HTML. This is the proper mind file. So the browser actually interprets it as HTML. And now we can test it locally if it works, I guess. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to go to this page. And it says uh, that I have a typo. Uh, where do I have a typo? It's not called is set, it's called is set. Okay. Yeah, now it works. We could see for a second the form and it redirected me. And I guess it tried to do something, but it got a 403 for some reason. Let's see. Uh, let's go to that page again. HTTPS, goodbye, call, doing test, yeah. uh, I'm going to click preserve here. HTTPS, can we call the NSDF? Oh, come on. Uh, okay. Okay. Here we go. Now we can look at the traffic, what happened. So it went to here and it got this. Then it grabbed the script and then it tried to send the session key. Everything is fine. We can now send it to intermuted. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to. Yeah, just do that. But I'm not going to show you how I'm sending the email. Um, okay, to intermuted subject funny cats and the link HTTPS gun veil. Okay, here we go. Right, didn't copy it. I still, I still. Do copy it. Okay, it copy it. Okay, and it's going to. Yeah, okay, so it's sent to intermediate. If the bot is still working, then we can do this. Grab. Oh, yeah, and we have uh, the session cookie. So now what we need to do is we need to go to this website. And we can, I guess, close the network tab and go to application. Um, cookies and add a cookie. How do I add a cookie? I add a cookie using JavaScript. Document dot cookie equals this. Oh, no, wait, 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 wait. I need to copy the all. Okay, here we go. And uh, now I have it set and we can, I guess, refresh the page or go to actually this. Yes, and we are in. So, perfect. Uh, we got it. Now, what was this? Mm, inspect. Oh, it's the flag for this challenge. Done. Okay, so that was the this challenge and as you could see it was actually a little more a little funnier to to exploit this challenge because you did have to do some typical xss exploiting or you could use the hunter um well you had to create the form anyway and submit the form so that when it goes to winter muted and winter muted clicks on the link the form gets displayed gets pre-filled with the xss and gets submitted and then you had to wait to harvest the password and if you do not have your own server you do not have your own https uh, just find a place where you can host a static page and that's enough for the form if and for the gathering do use the xss hunter which i did mention which is xsshunter.com and uh, yeah, familiarize yourself with it. Uh, do look at this uh, animated guide, which is on my screen of how it works. And uh, and yeah, and it's uh, it will gather the password for you basically. Cool. So uh, I think that was the one of the hardest hardest uh, challenges here. Let's go with, okay, um, I'm getting too far here, so let's start with uh, the admin UI, there are three of them. So, uh, admin UI 1. Okay, the command you just found removed the Fubanizer 9000 from the DMZ. DMZ stands for dem Demilitarized Zone. Um, yeah, it's basically the, like the secure area of the network. 
While scanning the network, you find a weird device called Tempomatic. Uh, Tempomatic, I don't know. According to a Google search, it's a smart home temperature control experience. The management interface looks like a nest of bugs. You also stumble over some gossip on the darknet um, about bug hunters finding some vulnerabilities. And because the vendor didn't have a bug bounty program, they were sold for free 49 a piece. Okay, that's hilarious. Uh, do some black box testing and yeah, let's see how it goes. So uh, what do I have open? I have IDA opened. I do not need IDA anymore. I do need a console. Again, it's Netcat, so I'm going to spawn a Linux console for that. Here we go. Um, LS, uh, no, uh, uh, NC dash V. Dash V is for verbose, so it uh, shows. Okay, so this is the management interface. Service access. Please enter the backdoor service password. Okay, the password is um, password. No, uh, authorities have been informed. Perfect. So, okay, I cannot do that. Uh, so let's uh, let's not do that. Let's reset the console. And let's try the second. Read the AUR. And the following patch notes were found, version 2 and version 3. Which patch notes should be shown? What I have to type it. Version 0.3. Okay, this means, uh, it's quite funny that you had to type it. Does it mean that, is it a, is it a separate file? Did we have to type a separate file? Why, why isn't it done in a menu like this? This is, this is weird. I'm, okay, I'm, I'm going to test it for a local path traversal. You basically do it like this. You type a dot, type a slash, and use the, the same thing. And if the same thing displays, that means that's a path traversal, because this is, you know, a path, like this directory, slash, and the file. And the same thing displays, this is a path traversal. So we have a path traversal attack, so we can start doing weird things. So read, and we want to, what do we want to read? Uh, I'm going to start with, I don't know, is there a flag? Flag. No flag. Is there a, I don't know, password? No password, okay. Is there a, I don't know, a, in the upper directory flag. Oh, there is a flag. Here we go. Hello there. So yeah, um, that's it. I'm going to copy it. If you cannot guess it, I'm going to show you how to do it uh, without guessing in a second. So, but yeah, uh, boom. Okay, done. And uh, now I'm going to show you how to do it without uh, without guessing. Uh, I, I do not need to, to know the flag. So without guessing, what you do is you dump the uh, you dump this uh, this process. So and to and we will need to do it anyway. So this is basically I'm already starting on the next task. Uh, we go here and we need to dump the process. And to dump the process, you go to like I don't know how many directories there are, but you cannot go over the top. Even if you say go above when you're on the, on the top, you will stay on the top. And that's fine. I need proc, which is a special file system self, which is current. It's a, a, a link to the current process. And there's something called, um, I guess we can do like uh, either exe file to dump the exe file or like cmd to see the uh, cmd line to see the command line. Uh, that's a typo, obviously. So two. Okay. And well, this isn't telling too much, but I guess we can now do main. In fact, uh, sorry, two main. Okay, and uh, this is the binary, so we can read. No, we can't. We, we should dump it. It's probably an L file. We will need to reverse engineer it. So to dump it, I'm going to do mm, like this. Uh, I'm going to create uh, some comments, and the comments are going to do. Uh, so let's do like this echo dash e, which is for escape, uh, and second option on the mini, then a new line, and then main. Yeah. And uh, I want to pass this into nc dash v and this. So I want the, the um, option to be, sorry, the command to be sent automatically, and whatever is the output of netcat, I want to store it in a local file and call the file something uh, kind of like ASDF. Okay, uh, uh, come on, let's do the typos. Okay, and it's probably already dumped the file, so I can just exit. And we have an ASDF file appearing here. I'm going to, in the hex editor, remove uh, the beginning, because the beginning is this management interface command that we uh, com comment that we saw. And the elf file actually starts here, um, like from 7f. 
this is the start of the end file because you can see the end of a line here. So I'm going to go here and remove everything and uh, save it and we can now put it in IDA. Oh, this is a 64-bit uh, file, so I need this idea. Again, you can use any disassembler, you can use binary ninja, you can use radari2, you can use object thumb. Uh, but if you have IDA, the full version of IDA, you can do this. And if you do this, yeah, you can see that there's like this patch those directory. So this is why we had to do two dots and slash to get to the flag and get to the main file. How do we know it's the flag? Uh, there's this primary primary so primary login file and you can see that it opens the file flag here. Now, uh, you do not have to have a decompiler to actually do this or there are some open source decompilers by the way but you can try to use it on the file. You can read everything here in assembly and uh, there's actually I think in one of the next tasks there's a, a, a gotcha uh, re regarding decompiling where looking in assembly is actually required to get the correct meaning but um, yeah you don't need it you can look through it in assembly anyway. Cool, so, um, so yeah, now we can uh, go basically to this task, which is UI2. The first flag was a dude. I, I don't know what's a dude, but it was a dude. Um, but I think using a similar trick to get the full binary, yeah, this is what we've already done. We have already the full binary. There's at least one password in there somewhere. There is a password in the binary. We need to look for it. Maybe reversing this will give you access to the authenticated area. Then you can turn up the heat, literally. Like, yeah. Um, so let's uh, look through, through it. Now, um, this is obviously the flag we got, but the next flag is probably in the secondary login. So we go to the secondary login function. You don't need the decompiler to see the names, by the way. The names are in the symbols anyway. So whatever uh, disassembler you use, you will see it as well. And and this is by the way where things get funny because mm, <laughs> this is a bug. Uh, this actually accepts whatever passwords you password you give it. I think um, if like if the length is uh, is 35 of, of the password. Otherwise, uh, I think it's access denied, but if the length is like this, then it accepts anything because it's, it was supposed to be mem compare in the source code, but um, someone made the typo, which happens on CTFs, and uh, did mem, uh, uh, sorry, uh, did the same typo I did just here. I was supposed to write mem compare, but I written mem copy. So this is what mem copy looks like after being inlined. And it's not comparison, it's assignment, but I guess this is pretty much telling anyway the flag, right? We can also see that there is XOR here again with this value, which means this is an XORing of the flag and then comparing. It was supposed to be comparing the password. It doesn't matter for the solution, but the typo was made. This is fine. Let's go here. I'm going to copy it. Uh, so this is it, what I'm going to copy. Yeah, just copy it. Mm, oh, come on. Copy, now I need to put it in some go.python or whatever you want to call it. Here we go, and uh, yeah, that's fine. And now I want to exit it with, uh, sorry, here, exit it with this value, c7. So let's do it like this. Uh, I'm going to put it in a string in python called x. Now I'm going to remove all the spaces, so um, x uh, equals, uh, sorry, x.replace space, I think that's a space also here, not a tab. Yeah, I think it's a space. Replace it with nothing and I will also I'm going to replace all the new lines with nothing. So here we go. Now I'm going to decode it as hex. So this is why I'm using Python 2 because I can do just that. And I can do, yeah, beginners don't have the compiler, but uh, it doesn't matter. It's just a, a function of time if you have a decompiler or not, or not. And I still have a lot of tasks to do, so that's why I'm using a decompiler. And again, there are open source decompilers. So you do not have it in IDA, but there are open source decompilers which work to some extent. Not always though. Um, okay, and now I need to exit it. So I want to actually put it into a byte array because that's easier for me. And now, um, yeah, let's just do it the like old fashioned way. So for ch and x, like for all the characters there, um, add to o the character which code is uh, ch exhort with um, c7 which was the key and now print o and run it so here we go go okay and we have two passwords better than one k and this is the flag which means we did also solve the second ui click 
Perfect. Now we can log into the um, to the management interface. So that means that I actually do need to. Uh, I'm going to create a notes file, and I do need both flags because I'm going. Well, I do not need the second one. I just need a string which is similar in, in size, and I do need this flag as well. And they will be useful when exploiting the third one. So we are going after the third one. So let's see where we get after we actually authenticate. We get into the command line, and let's I guess. Uh, before looking at the code, let's just uh, do the same uh, here. So one and then two passwords and let's, let's see what we get. Mm. And uh, okay. Uh, so yeah, um, I'm pasting this, uh, enter and we are authenticated and we can do something after authenticated. I don't know what we can do because we need to look, I guess, in IDA after all to, to take a look. I guess you get get sx, whatever, you get a command. Is this a buffer overflow? Gets is usually a buffer overflow. I don't know why it's called gets x, but whatever. When we do quit, there's, there, these are the commands probably because there's like comparing whatever we enter with the command. So quit version uh, shell and shell should span us a shell. This is, oh, it's disabled. Um, if this shell enabled is equal to one, then we get a debug shell, otherwise it's disabled. Uh, then we have an echo, and then we have, um, this is a buffer overflow. Uh, this is a format string back. So we have already a buffer overflow and a format string back, which is, which is fine. And then we have, um, and this is by the way where the, this is I think where the compiler, oh, is it fine? Maybe it's not this task because this, is, this looks fine. The shell enabled has to be equal to one in any case. Uh, if it's the bug, then it displays uh, some mappings, which might or might not be needed. Uh, let's actually look what protections, what mitigations does this binary have. And I, um, I have this thing called checksec, uh, checksec.hsh. Uh, that's, sorry, that's, uh, that's not an address, that's the name of a script. And, and you can Google it. It's basically, a, I guess, a bash script, which... Um, it's supposed to tell you what mitigations are enabled in a binary. So do you have stack cookies, do you have um, position independent executable and so on. I already have it downloaded because it's really useful on CTFs. Uh, so let's see, we have, um, we have uh, no canary, we have NX enabled, so we cannot put code on the stack and execute it, that's, uh, that's uh, not a possibility. But we do not have a position on, uh, enabled executable, so whatever addresses we see in IDA are probably the addresses, ooh, yeah, these addresses, are the addresses which we get in memory. And uh, yeah, we can now think how to basically get shell access. Let's look at this, the back shell. It actually just runs bash for us. So this is amazing. This is what we are going after. Um, now, uh, okay. This means that, uh, yeah, how do we enable the shell? Oh, and we already know we have this uh, format string. Uh, if you're new to this, uh, you need to learn about the basic vulnerability classes and see applications like buffer overflows, like format strings, like integer overflows, and so on and so on. Uh, given, yeah, given what I do, I know them. Uh, so I know that this is a format string. Cool, so uh, we might use that. Now let's look at two more things. First, where's the buffer? The buffer is on the stack, that's okay. Uh, where's this shell enabled thingy? This shell enabled thingy is in the BBS section. And I guess we need to set this address to one for it to be, um, to be okay. So let's do let's go with format format back here, because if I remember correctly, there is another uh, thing we need to go for later. Uh, sorry, there is a buffer overflow that we need to go for later. So basically, the way a format back works is that if we type echo and then, for example, percentage x, it's going to grab the next argument, which is on the stack, is not here, but which is on the stack. Uh, well, I guess it's going to grab echo, uh, sorry, on the stack or in a register, um, because this is the 64-bit. On 32-bit, it usually was the stack, usually, keyword. But on 64-bit, there are a couple of registers, and then it starts eating the stack. So, um, so yeah, uh, it grabs the value from the registers and then the stack, and uh, does something with it. For example, percentage %x is uh, do display me the number as hexadecimal and uh, percentage n is 
right to the memory location how many bytes has printf already outputted, which means we can write one, we can output one byte, we can write it to the specified memory location, which is this uh, variable, uh, and change it to one, basically. So this is why we want to use the um, percentage n, that's uh, small n. Cool, but we need to figure out some some things. So I guess I'm just going to. Uh, oh, I'm not going to use this. I'm going to actually use my. Um, sorry, I'm going to steal this for a second. I'm going to use my framework for writing uh, exploits because um, it's uh, a little easier. You know, if you're watching my live streams from time to time, you are familiar with it because this is what I'm using all the time. It's called Poundbase. I'm I'm not using the uh, the really popular popular ones, uh, but. Uh, my is, is rather short, it's, uh, it's good enough. So I don't need this, I can remove this because this is for emulation, I don't need emulation this time. Okay, cool. So I need to give it the host where it connects to, this is the host and this is the port. So the host, the port is, I almost already have it, perfect. And now I'm going to use my, it connects and I need to put my code here. And after I put my code, it actually gives me back the control so I can type commands and press enter and so on. So um, yeah, mm, first I need to like send uh, all. Send all is like send something, which, which I normally would type. And I'm going to send one and and enter then i'm going to send the first flag and and enter then i'm going to send the second flag and and enter and then i'm going to set echo sensory echo and oh mm. yeah I, I i'm basically going to send echo and something and that something is uh, and and enter i need an enter at the end as well like let's call it uh, xyz and xyz is going to be a string and it's going to be a funny string which looks like this um, percentage sign let's make it a little bit bigger sorry percentage sign then a number which means it's the number of the argument is a glibc function uh, sorry a glibc feature and a per, uh, sorry a dollar sign after that and then the type and i want to display stuff as x for, as hexadecimal for the beginning and i'm actually going to also do one equals here and then the same with two and so on and so on you get the picture but i'm not going to do it uh, well manually i'm just going to do for i in x range no i'm going to do join okay this uh, with uh, percentage i here I need two percentage and percentage i, 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 four, i, in, x range, and I want from one to 50. Ah, uh, that's, a, that's a nice range. Okay, and it will uh, print x, y, z. I'll just, just print it for my own sake, and then I send it. Okay, that's fine. So Python, phone base, and uh, I need a space here. So, uh, sorry, these are my notes. I do not need my notes here. Do it like this. I need a space here, so it's actually readable. Okay, here we go. Now, uh, I need one more thing. I need to put AAA, sorry, at the beginning of a string. So XYZ is going to be equal four A's plus uh, the string itself. And I'm going to, or actually, you know what? I'm going to do more A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Uh, eight, yeah, eight characters. And I'm going to see where in this output, in the hexadecimal output, actually these uh, codes appear. And that's going to be in hexadecimal, the capital A is 41, then capital B is 42, 43, 45, and so on. And I'm going to read the number and that will tell me where my argument is, because after, after this, for this argument, I need to put here uh, the address uh, of, uh, of a variable I want to replace in memory, the address where I want to write in memory. So, okay, let's do it. Here we go. And, okay, um, here, uh, no, not here. This, 44, 45, 46, this, this, uh, this is it. Uh, so 39, 40, something like that. Something along, along these lines is the place where I'm aiming at. Uh, if you're wondering why everything didn't display is because 
each argument is actually eight bytes, but I'm displaying with the X here only four bytes. So that's why four bytes have not been displayed there. But as you can see, um, some bytes have been displayed like uh, that's D, E, F, G. Okay, so I don't need this anymore. I don't need this, I don't need this. Now what X, Y, Z is supposed to be, um, it's quite funny because uh, if we look at it, no, please look that this address is writable, but there are also zeros here. And it's actually going to be little endian, which means that the zeros go, go at the end, but that also means that the, uh, this address should actually be at the end. So I should have something like this. I need to output at least one character because we need to put one here, right? So I end the percentage n the outputs the number of characters written out by printf. So I need to output one character, which is a. Then I'm going to have uh, 40, I, I, I guess like 40 or 39-ish thingy. And then I'm going to have n to do the write. Uh, I guess it's, it could be like HHN or something like that. HHN is actually write one byte, otherwise N is write four bytes. So it's fine for me to write four bytes. I do not care because I have to put it only one character anyway. And the address is going to be somewhere here. So before I go to that, I'm going to do X because I, uh, sorry, uh, small X, because I want to display where my address is. And I'm, I guess I'm going to do LX or LLX to actually, no, maybe, yeah, maybe LLX, because I actually need to figure out where exactly in the stream of A's uh, is my, um, well, is my address, right? So A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Yeah, so I'm just putting random um, letters here. So when I see them displayed, I will actually know which letter is, is that. Okay, so let's do this, and it displayed um, for B up to four four. So four four is D, and uh, yeah, from from the eight characters. So this is where I need to put my address. Okay, so from D, yeah, again, this is where I'm putting my address. And I'm going to put my address using DD, uh, DQ, sorry, DQ. Uh, dq is this function. It basically takes takes a number and outputs it as uh, eight bytes, uh, as you know, as a binary value of eight bytes. Uh, in little endian, by the way. So I need the address of this variable. Here we go. And I'm going to put it here. It's obviously hexadecimal, so I'm going to need ox here. Then abc. Let's see if this address is correctly displayed first. Uh, here we go. Um, yeah, it looks somewhat correctly displayed. Uh, obviously, part of it is going to be missing because it won't output the zeros, but uh, apart from that, that's fine. So let's try n here. And uh, yeah, like I changed the x to n to actually write the variable. And now let's say, well, what was it, debug shell or debug? I don't remember. It's uh, debug, so debug. Here we go. Oh no, it wasn't debug. It was shell, shell. And it works. So we actually successfully overwritten the variable. So we are in the shell and we got another flag. This flag is uh, which was in the first task, but we have also another flag, so let's just cut it. And here we go. This is code exec well played is the correct flag. So I can, I guess, stop the timer. And uh, sorry, where's my browser? No, oh, seriously, where's my browser? Okay, and this is uh, this task. So, um, I guess I this isn't yeah this is another another task. So I can close this. I can close this. I already don't need it. Again, I will publish my exploits. They will be on GitHub. So if you didn't really catch what I'm doing, you can analyze my exploit afterwards. Do not worry about it. Mm. Cool. Now, uh, okay, let's uh, let's go with this one. Message of the day. And it's another pawn because we can, you know, recognize the green color, right? So yeah, this is the file which was downloaded. It's a message of the day. 
Perfect. From the off, uh, off hub router, you jump onto the Google House Smart Hub. This fully featured assistant of the future uh, that uses machine learning on the blockchain <laughs> to control all of our IoT devices promises. Um, it, all. it delivers the ability to print a message of a day. The rest is available as a premium subscription service paid monthly. And we get both the service and we get an attachment. The attachment was already downloaded. Let's connect here and see what's, uh, what's up with that. Do I have all the other windows closed? I do have. Okay. And see, that should be. Okay, I can um, get the something, set the something. Get the something, then I can, I don't know, get the message of the day, set the message of the day. Uh, then set the admin message of the day. No, I cannot because uh, it's to do. And uh, get admin message of a date. I am not root, so I cannot. Yeah, I am not root. I cannot set the message of a day. So this is what we see. We can set our own message of a day. We can uh, get our own message of a day. Um, yeah, but uh, but that's it. Okay, cool. Let's see what the task is again in Ida. Here we go. I'm again going to cheat with the compiler uh, because of the time constraints. We still have a couple of tasks to go through. So it gets a line. Mm. Then, oh, it's the option, you know, the menu option. Then if the menu option is one of these, it goes here. And it executes one of these. Now we want to get into get admin message of the day and it checks uh, get, e, get you it if it's zero. You are not root or it reads the flag. If it reads the flag, it actually opens the file, which is called flag, then it reads it, and then it displays it. So yeah, um, read the flag, this is what we what we need to do. Uh, we do not have to cheat this function, we just have to run this function, whatever actually works for us, whatever is easier. Is it easier to maybe override uh, get you it in some way, or maybe it's easier to actually get the flag, so like read the flag. Uh, we did see the line pointer, get line, line pointer thingy, and line pointer is actually... Mm, so get line is going to allocate the line pointer, which is fine. Mm. Uh, this is funny because line pointer isn't actually initialized here, it should be initialized, and then get line is going to allocate the proper size of the buffer, so we do not have to worry about it. Uh, then, okay, let's see if I get and set message of the day. Mm, it actually calls gets. This is a buffer overflow. Uh, if you see the gets, gets function, it's a buffer overflow. The same if you see um, like char or car, however you want to call it, both one, two, three, and std c in, in buff in C++. This is also a buffer overflow, like the most standard buffer overflow you can make. So I guess, well, this is the beginner's tasks. This is what we are looking for, right? And then it's going to copy um, um, copy it wherever, but I don't think we care about it at this point because we see this is a buffer. The buffer, looking at this, this is a buffer of 256 characters. And then after the 256 characters, it actually... Um, yeah, that's something. We don't care. Uh, what we care is that this will overwrite the return address. When the function returns, it gets the address from the stack and it will return to that address. Now, uh, we will tell it, please return to mm, the read flag. So I'm going to create another, oh, I have a directory, I'm going to create a notes file and I will start noting things down. We do need to, yeah, we need this address, which is the notes address. Here we go. And we need, uh, we don't know anything else. We don't need really anything else. This is, this is fine. And I'm going to, uh, I, I need the, I took up basically the, the same um, bone base, which I did in the previous uh, challenge. So let's clean it from, from what I've written previously because we don't need this. Uh, what we need is we basically need to um, send all, we need to set set the user mes message of a day, so that's uh, 2n, and then if we do 2n, oh sorry, it, it timed out, it says enter message of a day and the new message, and we're going to send it the new message, so new uh, mod, duh, okay, and an enter key, 
Now, I don't remember, gets actually reads until the space, until a space. I think it ignores everything which is not a space, so mm, our new message of the day is going to be, uh, where's my notes, this address. I'm just brute forcing it right now. I'm going to do dq the address. Um, the buffer was 100 bytes long, uh, which means that I need 256 by 8. That's 8. Um, so 8, uh, about like uh, 15. Okay, so this is it. Like the address repeated 15 times. You just buffer overflow. Like uh, we are not trying to be surgical here. We are just brute forcing the stack. And exit. Uh, Python, did I save it? Uh, pound base. Here we go. Um, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, we are not in the right directory. So let's go here. Okay. Python, pound base. Here we go. Mm. Wait, uh, I'm not correcting to. We are in the right directory. I'm not connecting to the right service. My apologies for that. Okay. Here we go. Okay, okay, uh, choice. So it didn't, it didn't trigger. We entered the message, it didn't trigger. Uh, probably because we need to, it doesn't like the zeros in the address. Um, and that, that might be the thing. So instead of doing this, I'm going to do um, A times, we know 256 at least, and then I'm going to add the address to it. So this is going to create a string which is 256 A's one after the other, and then it's going to do the binary form of the address. Uh, let's try it with 256. It will be too little, probably, because there is usually something else on the buffer, but let's try it. Uh, now, mm, let's add plus 8. Yeah, we got it. We have overridden successfully the, uh, the return address, and it returned to the read flag function, and the read flag function actually displayed it, which is fine. I guess the task is solved. So yeah, this wasn't a surgical buffer overflow. This was just like, let's try different things. Um, like, diff yeah, this filled the buffer and then plus 8, plus 16, plus 24, I would go like this until I think I would override the buffer, which I did with the return address of the function, which actually displays the flag. So that's it. Cool. Mm, we have uh, five, six, six, six left. Okay, so let's start with this one. It's a media PC, a fully purchased, um, sorry, let me close this. A fully purchased through the online subscription Revolution Empire, gimme da. Okay. Uh, the PC has a remote control service running that looks like it will cause all kinds of problems, but it was written by someone who watched too many um, 90s movies. You download the binary from the vendor, begin reversing it. Nothing is the right way around. Perfect. Let's do it. It's called gatekeeper. And yeah, this is the file which got downloaded. What what kind of a file is it? It's an elf file again. And it's 64-bit elf file. So, oh, well, let's open it in IDA. Okay. Here we go. Again, I'm going to cheat with the compiler. Uh, okay. Um, I guess we, oh, so this is how we use it. We put in user and password. And it says, uh, if it, what it compares to this, it says correct. Uh, I got mad skills, is it like this? It's like from the reverse, just it. Yeah, this is a function which does like grabs a character and gets it from the end to the beginning and the other way around. This is like, uh, if you've implemented reversing a string, this is what you re will remember. And what's the user? Or is it just, just this? Well, I'm going to copy it and I'm going to reverse it. Uh, so, sorry, do I have, uh, do I have a Python console? I need a Python console for this. Python. Okay, let's let's just try it. CTF this done, solved. Okay, so 
So that was just it. It was a super easy reverse engineering challenge. As you could see, you had to just figure out uh, what you had to do and, and that's about it. Um, perfect. So we have these challenges left. Let's go from the top. MediaDB. Okay, so now we have an attachment. And uh, the text is, the gatekeeper software gave you access to a custom database to organize a music playlist. It looks like it might also be connected to the smart fridge to play fridge, fridge. We're, we are going after the fridge because the cake is in the fridge. Uh, if you remember, you know, the story. Um, to play custom door alarms. I don't even. Uh, that's a really smart fridge. I need to get one like that. Maybe we can grab an O. OAuth token uh, that gets us closer to the cake. Okay, and this is something and we have an attachment. So uh, we did download the attachment, it's called MediaDB. Um, okay, and it's Python, perfect. Python reverse and ring, I like Python. I like Python a lot. So, but there's also Netcat, so let's connect to the port and let's see what's, uh, what's up with that. Again, by the way, if you have any questions, uh, do put, give them to Kshak if they are related to the task, he will give me them immediately. Otherwise, I will answer the questions after the stream. Uh, unless there is one million of them, then I will answer some of the questions. Okay, we can add the song, we can play artists, we can play a song, or we can shuffle artists. Okay, that's cool. So, what... Okay, I already see here, this looks like... This is SQL. If there is SQL, it's probably SQL injection. This is another classical vulnerability, which you have to know. If you're into web security, you have to know it. So what's going on here? We, uh, oh, to bet this isn't input. If, it, if this was input, we would have Python code execution. That would be so, so easy, but it's not. Okay, uh, do we have anything else here? Okay, we... Okay, there's a table called OAuth tokens. So this is probably what we will have to go after. There's a table called media, that's fine. Then we can, it's funny because it replaces all the quotes with nothing. It removes the quotes. So, okay, because it's using the quotes everywhere. So it's using the quotes here, it's using the quotes. It's not using the quotes here. Why is it not using the uh, why was it using single quotes here? It should be using double quotes if it's removing them, because it's not removing single quotes anywhere. So I guess this is already our bug, right? Uh, that you you can insert something which which cannot contain double quotes, but it can contain single quotes. And then you put a single quote here, and you do a normal um, SQL injection attack. So so yeah, let's let's go after it. Let's actually test it. Uh, I'm going to do. Yeah, a notepad is what was really important to have at uh, for this stuff. So let me move it here. Okay. Now what we need is uh, you know what I'm actually going to switch it. Okay. I'm going to grab this. Okay, we have this, and this is actually artist name, song name, uh, two or three where we have the injection. Now we have injection here, what do we want to put in this place? In this exact place where my cursor is. Where we want to, I guess, do this. We do not care about anything which is in the song, so we do limit as, or like, uh, and one equals zero. So basically, this means one is never equal to zero, right? So we are getting all the artists and all the songs where artist is equal to this, and uh, this is false, which means this is false, which means we are not getting anything. But what we can do here is we can do union, which um, basically connects to SQL queries, and this is where we can start typing our own query. So select, and uh, so what was the name of OAuth table again? It was called OAuth token. So we get OAuth token and one, because we need two fields. There are two fields here, it's getting two fields, we need two fields, and this can be just a constant number, we don't care. Uh, from of tokens, uh, that's it. Um, where uh, one equals one, or because we still have this, this is still here, we need to get rid of it somehow. Or like an empty string is equal an empty string. So this is basically what I'm injecting, this part, which I've highlighted. Let's try to uh, inject it and see what's, uh, what's up with that. 
So add song. Uh, whoops, I timed out. Artist name. Artist name. Uh, what are we injecting again? Uh, so what are we selecting again? I think we are selecting artist. So that's fine. We are injecting exactly here. What's the song name? I, I don't care. ASDF. Now do play me play, play me the song. Song name ASDF. Uh, okay. Play me the artist. Artist name. Hmm. Or is it here where I'm supposed to do the injection? Uh, I, I'm confused. I'm adding this, then it's going to select it where art is. No, I'm, do I'm here, this is where I'm doing the injection, but this is removing it. This is removing, so no, 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 this is not where I'm doing the injection. Uh, uh, this is where I'm doing the injection. Because it actually is removing it here, but it is... Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is what I was uh, looking for. I, I used not the, not the correct one. We are using this one. Where format artist chosen. This is option four. We are exploiting option four. Time out again. Uh, shuffle artists. There is no artists. Sorry. Um, add song artist name. Uh, song name two. Shuffle artists four. And here we go. CDF rich cast so have token something. Yeah, it basically like put our injection here, and uh, and yeah, and that's it. Good game. So I can close it. We can copy this. This is a typical SQL injection. If you're into web security, you need to to learn to do SQL injections. You could use uh, tools like SQL Map, by the way, but uh, I prefer this way. Cool. We have four challenges left. Let's go with uh, this one. Poetry. Poetry. Or is it pottery? No, it's poetry. Looks like the Google house has connected to the fridge. The credentials are only reachable by root. There is a suite binary that has all the... A suite binary, perfect. All the hallmarks or why are you a suite binary? Okay, so suite binary is a binary which you can run, but it, it is being run with higher privileges than yours. For example, admins privileges. And uh, usually it's something which exists only on the Unix systems. It's not something that exists on the Windows system, uh, as in being able to run this library. on. You can communicate it on Windows with, with such binaries, of course, but you cannot run them. And on Linux, you can actually run them, and that means half of your environment is being passed to, to that uh, venue span process, and that is usually shady. Why are we a suite binary? Yeah, that's true. Like, usually custom suite binaries are a bad idea. Probably a good place to start. We have an attachment and we do have uh, a link. So perfect. The creator, this, yes, I did. Here we go. And let's get this. This is also an L file, so I'm going to open it in IDA. How many files do I have open? Not many. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to spawn a Linux console. Here we go. And I'm going to connect to that service and Oh, oh, we, we have a shell. Hello there. So I guess we are we are user this one and the poetry user is I guess we are in that group, but that's about it. Let's go to home. And in home we have a poetry and uh, poetry. And yeah, we have the flag. As you can see, the flag is being owned by the poetry user. We do not have access to it. Only this user have uh, has access to it. Sorry. And this is the binary, and it has the suite flag. The S here means it's a suite binary is going to be run. It's suite is for set UID. Set this user's suid is sorry ID when running the binary. So is this binary is going to be run with this user? So we have to figure it out how to. Um, what does it do? Oh, actually, I don't know. It doesn't do anything. Let's see what it does here. Okay. Um, so it's going kind of here. We have um, if this LD bind now is not defined, then read a link from this. This is, by the way, uh, the file which uh, you could have used to get the executable file in admin UI, uh, the first one. It reads the link. The link usually points to the usually points to the proper 
um, executable file unless the file has been deleted when it's uh, when cell two find here. Um, and then it says this and it executes again. So basically, it checks if it's running with this uh, environment variable set and if it's not running with this environment variable set, then it sets this environment variable and restarts itself, like runs it again. Uh, assuming that uh, it's assumed that the destination, which is this, um, yeah, it, it reruns the same file again, basically. Which already means there might be some race condition here, by the way, because on Linux you can remove the file you are running, but we cannot remove a pottery file, of course, but we can make a hard link to it. So there will be two files pointing to the same data set on the disk. And uh, a hard link uh, is also a sweet binary if I, or maybe, a, no, a hard link won't be a solid binary, a soft link, a soft link would be a sweet binary. So we can do that. And otherwise it puts this, uh, it didn't put this out, but whatever, but it then exits. So it, it tempts us with a buffer overflow, but it then exits. If if you have a buffer overflow and it just goes exit and it doesn't return, doesn't do return, then it might be useful depending on what is exactly going on between the buffer overflow and the exit, but there is nothing going on here. So, yeah. Okay, so, uh, yeah, mm, let's see. What we can do, I guess. Uh, what we will do is we will basically do. Um, I guess I'm going to show you a trick. Let's just disconnect. The trick is like this: if you have a binary file, let's just grab a uh, Python binary. So user bin Python. I'm going to copy it here for a second, just for demonstration purposes. I'm going to run it. And it's running, right? And uh, jobs uh, dash p. It's, this is the pid. If you check proc uh, this pid and uh, exa, it actually points to my to the Python binary, right? Now I'm going to remove the Python binary. Goodbye, Python binary. Is a uh, text file is busy. Uh, I am. This is because I'm on a weird file system. If I wouldn't be on a weird file system, or maybe you know what, if I could do uh, this, I can. I'm going to run another console next to it. But I'm a really on a really, really weird file system now. So that might be why it's busy. Mm. Yeah, uh, let's, uh, you know what, let's do the same experience, but I'm going to go to TMEP. And let's uh, see, here we go. Python z jobs dash p dash p okay mm, ls dash la la sorry uh, proc exa okay and now I'm going to remove tmp temp python okay now it's removed because it's, uh, here I'm on like on I was on the Linux disk mapped from the from sorry on, on the Windows disk mapped from Linux and that's uh, works a little differently. And now let's see, I removed the file, right? Let's see what it outputs. And it outputs, as you can see, something like this. And ls is actually using read link, the same thing that uh, the program is using. So now it actually has something like this, tmp space deleted. So what happens if we create a file which is called tmp space deleted? And actually that file would be doing something magical, for example, cutting the flag. Uh, that means that if between between when um, this is called and uh, and this is called, if we manage to squeeze in deletion of that file, then it's going to execute a file which is named poetry brackets deleted. So yeah, this is what we will have to do. We will have to, um, I guess I either copy or hard link that file or soft link. Let's see how how it works with soft links. Uh, I'm quite curious. So ln dash s user bin python and asdf. Now let's run asdf. Let's do this uh, jobs dash p. This is the second job because the first one is still running. So yeah. And here, how it reacts to soft links. And to soft links, it reacts, no, it just goes after the, after whatever the links points to. It didn't say ASDF. So um, I'm going to, you know what? I'm actually going to kill those iPhones. How about we do a hard link? Can we do a hard link? 
but I'm, I'm not sure about actually I'm not sure about halvings and sweet binaries. This is probably not going to work, but uh, yeah, whatever. So link a hard link without dash s uh, user bin python asdf uh, yeah. operation not permitted. I cannot do hard link because I'm probably on different uh, I'm on different file systems. You know what? I I think we actually will have to test it on online. So yeah, let's connect again. Let's go to home poetry, uh, but here we will we won't be able to create the link. We need to go to our home directory, which is user. And now let's create a hard link, uh, home poetry, poetry, as if. And yeah, it's still suet, which is amazing. Why is it suet? That's, that's weird. Linux, should you behave like this? Uh, okay, so we have this, now I should create, I don't know, I, I should run, uh, copy, let's copy bin bash here, bin sh, bin s, no, uh, bin cat, because we're going to cut the flag immediately. Here, and let's call it asdf uh, deleted. Yeah, okay. So we have these two files, now what we are going to do is we are in the loop, so while um, probably need this. So I'm going to remove ASDF. Now, while true, um, do a link, run it in the background. So run uh, ASDF poetry uh, flag in the background. Background with, uh, you know, you do with an under ampersand. And then delete it, delete the ASDF file. Done. Mm, what? It says it doesn't like me. Uh, and this is the moment where I need my notepad. Where is my notepad? Okay. Uh, sorry. Do I actually don't need? Let's do it like this. I think I need to do this. Uh, yeah, yeah, this will be fine. Like uh, add brackets. Uh, come on. Um, you know what, I, I'm going to copy all the comments which I've written. So CP. While to do, I forgot to do. Uh, so maybe this will be, no. okay. So I'm going to CD home user, then I'm going to do this, okay. Connect to this, and we get a flag. Yeah, perfect, that's it, that's it. It already like after this didn't work, it worked the next time. And we successfully removed the file. Uh, we removed the file and then... Oh, Marbel, thank you for the donation. Um, greetings from Silesia. Okay, hello. Yeah, we removed the file, therefore when the read line got executed, uh, it said uh, sorry, various conditions actually be, be between here. I, I mentioned incorrectly, but the various conditions here is actually starts here. Um, it uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, this one gets uh, got ASDF deleted. Blah blah blah. So this exec v run ASDF deleted instead of ASDF, which means it run bin cat, and then it passed also the arguments. It passed the arguments to bin cat which uh, the, the arguments to us, uh, the flag, so because it was executed with higher privileges, with the other user's privileges, that means it actually cut the flag. So we have a flag, here we go. Uh, this isn't a, an obvious race condition out there, and I did have to Google quite a lot uh, before I learned it. So uh, if you missed this task, this race condition, that's fine. That's okay. It's, it isn't obvious. Cool. Uh, three tasks left. Okay, uh, I guess we can close this. Uh, this is fine. Uh, no, we are not going for it. We're going after filtered env. Filter env, sorry. Uh, perfect. Do we have an attachment? We do have an attachment, yes. Uh, oops, 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 oops. Um, cool. Uh, we do have uh, a C file this time. So let's look what uh, and what, what else do we have? 
we do have this. Uh, which means uh, I'm going to spawn a Linux console and we're going to connect to it again. Uh, oh, uh, we got bash again. Okay, perfect. Uh, sorry, did I connect to the right task? Yes, we did connect to the right task. Using your shell on the temp omatic, you can see the credentials file for SmartRidge 2000. You can't read it through, uh, though. Only, uh, so we, yeah, mm, only that mysterious root user can. There is this weird suit binary, another suit binary on the temp omatic that looks like it might be what you need to try um, to exploit. Okay, we, we basically have another suit binary that we need to go after. Cool. Uh, so we go to home, mm, adminium, we do go to adminium. And then we have a flag, which again, we cannot access and we have this filtered end, which we do have the source code for. Uh, so, what do we do here? We basically need to, oh yeah, what's going on here? It's, uh, it's running bin user reality. No, it, it has an argument for bin new. So it's running this ID, right? It's running it here. And it um, sets everything to root user and it's set new env. It runs this, which waits for new environment. Uh, let's, let's just run it. Zero filter env. Yeah, it's waiting for new environment. And then it. Um, False. Okay, whatever. So there are some bugs. It reads the environment, then it clears the environment, and then it filters the environment. So let's see at reading the environment. It gets a line into the line, and that's fine. This is this is okay. Mm, then there cannot be more than 32 lines. It allocates space for the line on the heap. No, for the whole env. Yeah, this is a um, an array of pointers. So it allocates it, then it... Uh, what is this? Mm, it replaces the end new, new line with... Uh, yeah, it like strips the new line from the end. And then it puts the line here. So basically, yeah, it's uh, basically an array of... Um, so it's an array of uh, strings, of um, well character pointers in in reality, and then it's uh, at the beginning the array is null. Then it reallocates it to be the size of n, so one string or one string pointer. Then it puts that pointer into the array, and then I guess later it uh, reallocates it again, so it's of two pointers. It still keeps the first pointer because that's reallocate. And it puts again the new pointer to the end. So every line we type, it basically keeps adding it to a, um, a newly allocated um, array of, uh, of pointers, which is okay. And then I guess, uh, since it's, I think it looks like it's creating a normal environment variable, so at the end, what we should find is it puts like a null, um, a null at the end of the, uh, of the array, so it can be passed to exec v as a normal uh, environment, because the normal environment is a uh, array of pointers terminated by the null, so the null is he. Yes, yeah, there is no null here. There should be a null here usually. Okay, let's see what uh, what else is going on here. So after uh, after that, we get clear env. So clear env, what, where are we clear env? There's a lull here, okay, that's fine. Um, sorry, but where is clear env? Or is it a uh, like, it's not here, it's probably a library function, so let's just ignore it. Environ is a global variable for defined in libc, which is responsible for environment. And as you can see, it just pa pays this array. It should be null terminated. I don't know why it isn't null terminated. It should be null terminated. Uh, this might be a bug. And then it goes filtered end. And as, as you can see, yeah, as you can see, it's walking until the null. But there is no null. There never was one. So this is where things get really, really funny. Because uh, it tries to, what, what does it do? It gets the environment variable, and then if it's not null, then it sets that environment variable to 
uh, to something, which is this is even funnier. What, what if we have the same variable twice? If we have the same variable twice, uh, then it actually get end will always return a pointer to the first one. So you know, if we have like uh, LD preload once uh, with something and LD preload again, then get end will always return a pointer to this one. And it will set it to nothing. But then we have another entry and then we again get end on this one, it shouldn't do get end. It should like operate straight on that pointer. So this is a bug which we we can bypass the filtering. So it doesn't matter. Whatever we put uh, twice, it will already be exploited, and uh, we can use LD preload. LD preload is a, a link or time variable which basically allows you to specify a mm, dynamic library which is going to replace some functions. Which I guess. Uh, uh, user Ben Uit is going to call. So let, let's see what Uit actually calls. Um, this is my, my, my home PC, obviously. So S trace. Blah, blah. Uh, no, 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 S trace. L trace. Because we need library functions, not syscalls. And uh, yeah, it calls like this, for example. So we're going to replace this function. It doesn't matter which one, w whatever, uh, with uh, something which cuts the flag. So that's uh, this. Let's just. I'm going to create my own library, which is going to be called asdf.c. Here we go. Mm, this is what we are going to replace. Now let's connect to that service once again. And uh, we need to figure out how to put our binary there. Uh, so do we have uh, wget so we can download it? No. Can we download it using curl? No. Can we download it using bash? Because uh, I don't know if you know, but there's actually a, a magical feature in bash when slash dev slash tcp is actually going to connect to whatever. So called wind um, pl80. No. So the, that bash feature is disabled. So we cannot download anything. Uh, do we have netcat? We don't have netcat. Do we have socat? We do not have circuit, so we cannot download anything. We have to like paste something in. Can we? Uh, do we have uh, Gcat? Uh, Zcat, sorry. Mm. We do have Zcat. This is fine. Zcat is for compression, so we can uh, do something smaller. Uh, Zcat is basically gzip, but uh, in using pipes. Do we have base64 for decoding? Base64. We do have base64, so we can. Uh, create a library, base64 it, and then like put it somewhere on the file system and then do the LDP reload dance and that's it. Cool, so we have this, uh, let's do man, let's, uh, uh, oh, that doesn't matter what, what type it is, we don't care what type it is, we're just going to do. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Uh, where's the flag? Uh, it's called flag in the uh, what's the directory adminium. Yeah. yeah. So we don't care about the arguments, but we are going to open a file um, which is called this read binary. Okay, and we are going to read it to some buffer. Um, buff. We don't care. It. Let's just zero it. Oh, it's seeing. So we have to do this. And we need to read to the buffer uh, at most this characters. We can close, we don't need to close it, we can just put it in the buffer. Okay, so that's fine. So this is what we are going to... Um, uh, sorry, Shaco, could you repeat it? Oh, yeah, I don't have a flag. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, I also see that Hooker's noted it on the chat, so thank you. Okay, so this is yeah, this is our library which I'm going to um, create. So DCC uh, shared asdf.c conflicting types. I don't care. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, seriously, asdf.so. Now I need to compress it. So gzip gzip uh, asdf.so. That's gzip to now, as you can see. And now I need to base sixty four. Uh, and code this file. So this is it. And I'm going to dump it to somewhere. No. No, no. Alright. So yeah, this is it. Now I need to. How many lines is it? 40 lines, uh, a little more. Yeah, I need to basically somehow send it to to the server, right? So I can do. Um, 
let's do it like this. I can do echo and then this and then write it down to home user asdf.srd. Okay, cool. So we have this. Uh, let's see if we can just like do it like this. Here we go. Uh, come. Okay. There is, oh, what? I cannot write to you here. You're, you're joking. Mm, CD home user. And I cannot. Oh, but there's a temp directory. Maybe I can write here. I cannot display it. Do I care about displaying it? No, I don't. So, yeah, uh, let's do it like once more. Uh, okay, this isn't working. Okay, mm, TBP, that's fine. Okay, so now I'm copying it. Uh, let's try it again. What do you mean, home user TBP patch ASDF? Uh, this is. Is this touch is the. Oh, I can create files here. Alright, so that's fine. So, okay, uh, once more. Just MEP. Okay, yeah. Okay. Mm. Yeah, uh, it's there. So, I can uh, do base64 first. So uh, base64-d asdf so tz to uh, uh, xyz so tz. Now I can do g unzip tyz. And okay, and it's uh, I think it's pretty much ready. So now what I need to is let's just go here. Ld preload equals to tmp van uh, XYZ. So that's it. Uh, we need it at least twice. I think twice would be, would be fine. So now home um, add menu whatever that was. Add how how is it called? Filter and home add me new. Anyway, I, I don't know how to read it. Filter and segmentation fault color dumped. Why is it color dumped? Uh, does does it work at all? Maybe you know. Maybe the service is actually not running and uh, no variable set. Yeah, that's fine. I disconnected. That's not good. No, it works. Uh, so that's my mistake. Uh, somewhere. Um, why is it my mistake? Yeah, you know what? I'm going to do two more things. I'm going to copy these two things and put them at the end here. And then I'm going to. Oh, that was weird. That actually should work. Let's do this. Uh, I'm going to copy paste it here. So go, I run it. Let's do some more. Right Okay, and copying it, and let's re retrying basically. Yeah, okay, and we got it. I don't know why it didn't work the first time. It should have worked. So yeah, we basically tricked it into by to bypass the filter, so it basically like cleared out the first one, but totally didn't clear out all the other ones which we declared. And then it LD preloaded, preloaded this library, and we replaced, we hooked the function strrchr, so search for reverse uh, character in a string, and opened the flag and read the flag uh, in it. So that's it uh, with this challenge. Perfect. That means we have two challenges left. 
Okay. Which is uh, pretty good because the stream we are what already three hours into the stream, right? So it's time to, to finish it. Fridge to do list. Perfect. Fridge to do list. One of the main selling points of Smart Fridge 2000 over the Smart Fridge <laughs> 1999, nobody names versions like that, is that it comes with a to do list network service. We heard that Wintermuted uses this list as a password storage. Maybe you can find a bug and leave the notes. Luckily, we found source code. Oh, we perfect, we have a source code. And we again, so yeah, this is going to be another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is going to be, oh, we have a source code and we have a binary. So what do we have here? I'm going to go through the, through the, yeah, from here. It prints the banner if authenticates me. How does it authenticate me? User, and then it reads the user, reads the line, and it has to be an unfamiliar string. So that, that's only it. That's not, very, not really authentication. It's just like, what's your username? Uh, then I can print a list. I can print a to-do. I can store a to-do. I can delete a to-do. And I can... Um, Call admin. What's an admin? We want to call admin. Oh, okay. Sorry, remote administration is not available. I guess it's in the fridge 3000. Okay, then. Um, so, yeah, that's about it. So let's uh, look at printing the list. What's printing the list? The list is going to, if it's empty, it's empty. Otherwise, it just goes through them. And this is where the to dos are kept. What kind of structure is that? It's, it's basically a array of characters, like a 2D array, basically, of characters. Uh, I'm, yeah, I, I know, but it doesn't look like a 2D array, but that's a 2D array. Um, where each to-do has 64 bits, I guess. That's fine. So it goes through them, like through a 2D array, and then it uh, and displays them. So that's no magic there. What other options did we have here? We had print to do. Um, which entry would you like to read? And it can read an integer. And if it's more, oh, okay, this is a bug. Um, if it's more than to do count, then it's out of bounds. What if it's less than zero? Nobody is checking the lower boundary. It's a signed integer. It can be minus one. What happens then? Nothing. This is a bug. We found a bug. Perfect, but that just gives us reading something. It doesn't give us writing to something. Let's look at store to do. It doesn't check the lower boundary either. So we can do minus one, minus two, and we can put the to do there. Yeah, th this is amazing. We have a, a so-called re relative write what were and re relative read what were primitive, which is exactly what we need. Uh, let's what, look at the, not the binary. I'm going to need my, Bone base again for this one. Okay, and we are going to look at the binary because uh, everything we do from now will we will have to look in the in the binary. We absolutely do not care about this uh, source code. What we care for is where the to dos are stored. Oh, let's open to do FD. I don't care. I don't care. I care about Riddell. Where do you put them? Uh, let's maybe look at the store function, shall we? Store to do. Here we go. In which slot, blah, 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 blah. Um, bar for to do's. Here we go. It's here. Okay, so it's placed in the BBS section. And this is off limits to us. Well, we can write here, but that doesn't really matter. What we can look at and exfiltrate is whatever is above that. What's above that? Ooh, this is the got PLT table. If we overwrite any of these pointers, the pointer is going to be called at some point. Furthermore, since we have a read primitive, we can also read from one of these 
um, addresses and this will tell us where the binary is located in memory in in case it's a uh, it's a a ASLR is enabled, the position independent executable. Uh, it's a position independent executable. Let's see that with another use of the checksec. Checksec uh, script, oh sorry, uh, it's like this file to do's. Is it called to do or to do's? To do. Oh, pi is enabled. Uh, so we don't know where the binary is placed, we will have to leak that. That's okay. Um, Cool. Uh, okay, so yeah, uh, now the funny thing is that if you look at the source code, the store to do's, uh, sorry, store to do is uh, it's multiplying by to do length. What's the to do length? The to do length is uh, 48. So we can only jump in, yeah, in like. Uh, 48 bytes at a time. That might be a problem, or it might not be a problem. Let's see. Uh, since we have this, let's run Python. Uh, this is the address. This is hexadecimal. And let's see what addresses do we get if we, you know, start like decreasing. So, sorry. Um, let's go with hex uh, minus 48. Um, minus 48 times 2, times 3, times 4, times 5, times 6. And let's see where these addresses actually fall out, starting from the last one. Okay, so we are here. Uh, I need, uh, I really need a notes uh, right now, or like this will do for my notes. I can delete this because, uh, delete this because this is from the previous challenge. So this is actually right, which is cool. Then we have, um, sorry, oh, that's fine. Where's my console? Here we go, this address. It's this one, Esther and cat. I don't know if it's useful. Okay. Then we have the next one for, here we go. It's, uh, sorry, it's open. Is it open, really? And A2I is next. We, we probably are going to use that fact, but it's next. Okay, well, that's fine. That's actually already fine. Now, um, when we are leaking the address, we, because, you know, these are addresses into either the libc, the standard C library in memory, if and only if the function was called at least once. Because if it's not wasn't called at least once, it's actually going to point to the um, PLT section, proced procedural linkage table, which has a code which actually imports the function from the library and puts its address uh, here. So, and, and this section is in, uh, it's here somewhere here. Mm, control S, PLT. Yeah, uh, sorry. Yeah, but this is the section, uh, basically. And if we do like control numpad here, this is what jumps into, I think the function which is supposed to, to fetch it. So yeah, we either get the libc address or we get the address of this binary in the memory. What what do we want? Um, so whatever functions are there in the in the section where we were before, but was got PLT. Uh, system. Uh, we have system. So that's fine. Uh, we do not need libc address. We have system here already imported. We'll just use this address, which is here. That's fine. Okay. So yeah. Uh, right. Where, where, when is write called? In the application. Right. 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 Okay. It's called. Uh, it's not. Called, yeah. It's called here. And that's it. So when is this function called? This function is called when store to do's is called, and store to do's is called when we we exit. So we have guarantee that uh, so we are guaranteed that the write function wasn't called yet. Therefore, it's pointing into this binary. So that's fine. So what we are going to do is we are going to connect it. Uh, so this was uh, minus uh, six, minus five, minus four. 
so if we actually connect to it, and let's do just that, mm, they know down the address I didn't yet. So I'm going to replace it here because otherwise I will forget. Yep, sweet. Uh, and see that we go okay. Yeah, this is terrible. This is such a nice banner, but it got totally butchered. Yeah, no, that's better. User is DF, we don't care. We want to print a to-do entry and we want to read uh, number six. And yeah, this is what is the address for us, and that's cool. So what we have to do is we basically have to connect to the service, then send the user, ASDF, then we enter, then send the uh, two and minus six to get the address. And then we have to basically wait until this is displayed. Sorry, is there a space after this in the source code? Because that's pretty crucial here, actually. Yes, uh, there is a space here, which is good. Mm. So we read uh, until, we receive until, and this is a feature of my, my app, until this, and we totally ignore it, you don't care about it. Now we care about receiving until the end of the line from here. There is an end of the line afterwards, right? So we care about receiving until it. So, okay, and this is going to be the address, but it's, it's going to be only a couple of bytes because it won't display zeros. And uh, yeah, so we know that the top addresses will have to be zero, so that's fine. Uh, we totally do not need that end of the line at the, at the end, so we are going to remove it. And now we need to, while length of address is, sorry, address, is lower than 8 bytes, because all addresses have 8 bytes, when we are going to add a 0 at the end. Uh, this is a lazy way to do it, you, there are other better ways to, to do it, but I don't care. At the same. And now I need to change it uh, to this address into, uh, from a binary form into actually a readable form. And this is what I use RQ for, and RQ is, uh, yeah, just this, like unpack, Q, and this, yeah, so that's fine. And I can print now, but uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know what, I, what kind of address it is. I'm pretty sure that's the address of a binary in the procedural linkage table, but we'll figure it out in a second. Mm, okay. I need this. I do not. I do need this. So exit. Uh, have a nice day. Perfect. Python and uh, Perlin. Perfect. It says that this is the address, and this 916 uh, is what I'm curious for. See where this is uh, used. So Control X, and we go to here, and this is 10, which means that the pro procedural linkage table is here, and that bottom three uh, nibbles are need to match. So that's one 916. It is 916 here, so we know we have a binary address which can just subtra subtract one 916 from that. So minus uh, 916, and we know that we have the address of a binary, which means that we do also have the address of a system uh, call. So the system call is going to be somewhere here. Uh, let's just go here, jump here. Yeah, this is like 940. So this time it's address plus this. Okay, so we have also the system address, which is fine. So now we just need to replace uh, Something from here, we can replace whatever we, we pick um, to get a shell. And I'm going to go with uh, not open, I'm going to actually replace atoi because atoi is called every time I enter a number. I uh, like 65, enter, and um, atoi is going to be called because that's ASCII to integer. That's a conversion from a number into, sorry, from a string into a number. So yeah, I'm going to replace it. That was minus four, so I, I need to add eight to it, and uh, yeah, that's, that's about it. So let's do send all, and we do uh, two, then minus four, I said, and then I'm going to do eight a's. Uh, uh, is it eight? That's eight. And now I'm going to do dq to add the system address where to overwrite it, and I need um, a new line. Cool, and then I'm actually passing through to my interactive socket, so I get control back. Perfect, let's see. Mm, it uh, didn't work for some reason. Why didn't you work? 
fragments for you know what I'm going to do I'm going to actually do uh, one to oh, wait, 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 wait. Uh, store is free yeah I that was a typo yeah okay and I have shell access so I exploited it let's read the uh, there's a suit binary here it was weird um, okay where, where's the flag count zero Okay, mm. cut to do Okay. Mm. Okay, blah, blah, blah. Flag. Perfect. So we got it. Here's a flag. So, yeah, uh, if you have a read, uh, like, read what, read from where and um, uh, write what where condition like this a relative one is is rather it's not hard to exploit so we're at the end right now now i do not think i need this binary anymore open but i do need i am going to keep this open because we still have to exploit um the sweet binary uh, but before we get there i'm going to close this cool um here, holy beep. Holy beep is actually a, an actual vulnerability, by the way. That's it. We have code execution on the fridge. The fridge has the cake, and we are again after the cake. You can already see the secret cake recipe. Uh, no, we cannot. But okay. Oh, it's in the root directory. Okay. Winter Mutant's to do list has mentioned that the door alarm on the fridge is sounding all the time. This is usually a sign of a holy beep vulnerability. Maybe <laughs> I, I'm not sure that's really the sign. Okay, but okay. Maybe we finally found a way to get a root shell. Uh, you can smell the cake, uh, metaphorically. Yeah, and we get this. Which is, I guess, the binary which we already see here, right? Um, so this is the holy beep binary, this is it. And they said that the flag is here, and it is here, but we need to be admin to actually get there. Okay, so, last one, holy beep. Okay, and uh, we downloaded it. Is this one? Yes, it is. Perfect. Now uh, we can actually look what's the holy beep about, because uh, it is uh, it is a hint. If we go here, um, uh, I, I can I guess explain the fly, but uh, you can read on this website uh, with a magnificent logo. Uh, what is it about? Uh, that's not what I wanted to press. Here we go. Okay, the cake is a lie, uh, is it? Again, I'm cheating um, with, with the compiler. So it installs a signal handler, and then it opens dev console. Why, why is it opening dev console and not dash, slash dev console? This is already weird, funny, we can probably do something with it. A relative path in a suit binary is never a good sign. It opens it and it tries to do some IOCTL on something and if it, if it fails, it prints something to standard output for errors. And the signal handler is actually, it reads the, tries to do something, if it fails, then it does, uh, reads from the device, from the, de from the dev console and prints the debug data. Perfect. We basically know what we have to do. So this is the problem, right? But it opens dev console, which means that if we create a file, and again, we have code execution on the machine, if we can uh, create a file slash tmp slash dev console and launch this application from the uh, from tmp, it will open the, uh, our file, right? And our file can be a symlink to the flag, because why not, right? It can be a symlink. So we point to the flag, and then we somehow try to send the signal so that it actually reads the flag and output, outputs it. So that's it. Uh, this is uh, not a lot of code and it should be quite easy to do. Are we still on the shell? Yes, we are. So yeah, uh, oh, we cannot go like this to, uh, to TMP because we do not have um, a session established basically. Uh, I guess we can do SH and now, yeah, now we can go. Okay, there's nothing here. So yeah, uh, we will have to get the race condition in though. Mm. Okay, so we need nodes. Totally, we need nodes. What we need to do again 
is uh, we need to si send signal number 15. That's scale minus 15 and we need a PID. We do not know the PID, but we need the PID. Then the good thing is if you do like uh, a search something and then like, oh, yeah, that didn't work too well. Mm, yeah. Okay, search. Um, yeah, my point was that if you put something like uh, sleep, for example, let's put sleep in the background, then if you do jobs dash p, you get its pid a ten, which is which means we we're in some kind of the sandbox, but that's fine. So this is to get the pid. We probably will need to do it like this. Now, if you analyze the code, uh, we need this to be slow because we need to be able to send the signal handler uh, like the kill signal here. And uh, what it does, it goes through all the arguments. So the more arguments we have, the, the slower this is going to be, which is which is fine. We are going to use sequence for that. So echo, if we do sequence one, one step to like 100, it, it does something like this. So we can use this for making a lot of arguments. So um, what was that, by the way? Uh, home. Home admin, mm. home user, why is this a user? Well, it's a user, whatever, that's fine. So home user and holy beep. We need this, we need the sequence I was chatting about. Now we need to make it slow. How do we make it slow? Because otherwise it will like go through the arguments like crazy, like super fast, right? Um, there's a trick which I actually used. Um, when I was testing this. As you can see, it outputs only to standard output of errors, right? And uh, if we actually redirect the standard output of errors into a pipe, um, then like a, you know, like MKFIFO, uh, a kernel file system based device, then as soon as it will fill out up the kernel buffer, it will stop and freeze at that point, because the pipe buffer is like, let's say, I'm going to like make it up, um, five kilobytes, four kilobytes, whatever, it doesn't matter how much, but it's limited. And as soon as it writes four kilobytes into that, it's going to freeze and it's going to wait until the pipe is being read from on the other side. But we are not going to read from the pipe because we are going to send the kill signal. Uh, so yeah, this is basically what we, what we want to do. So we want to, um, oh, and we uh, actually, we need to create the, uh, symlink to, sorry, what was it again? Secret guy recipe. Uh, so, okay. We launch bash, we go into TMP, we create dev, and we create a symlink to this file, which is called dev, uh, sorry, TMP, TMP dev console. So it opens actually this link, this file. It opens uh, using a link, it opens this file. Then we call this, and we redirect the output of errors into a, uh, well, into what, mk fifo. We, we need to create a pipe. And uh, we put the pipe, we name it uh, xyz, because why not? This is a perfect name for a pipe. And we put it in the background. Okay, so this is now running in the background, and it freezes at some point. It, it, no, it's not running in the background yet, because bash is trying to open this file, uh, this pipe and it doesn't open until something else opens it from the other side. So we open it from the other side and we open it with sleep. So we sleep, I don't know, 30 seconds. And uh, we actually opened the, sleep is not going to read it. We don't care about reading it. Um, well, we kind of do because the flag is going to be at the end of it, right? Because it outputs the debug data at the end. So we need to read it, but sleep is not going to read it. We need to create a bash process using brackets and we need to actually cut it. Yeah, let's just, let's just cut it and that's it. Um, so yeah, this is going to create a new bash process. This is what the brackets do. The process is going to sleep 30 seconds and then it's going to output anything which goes into the standard input. Now, um, what goes into the standard input is the receiving end of this pipe. So basically, um, the holy beep is going to be sending to one end of the buffer, and the other end of the buffer is going to be read from after 30 seconds from this. So that means that if we put this as well into the background, we basically have, uh, we'll basically um, can get the 
um, the pit of this because we need the pit of this. So yeah, we, let's just do like yes, aux. Uh, but it will have all the arguments. Where are the arguments? The arguments are not yet here. We need to put the arguments here. And we need a lot of arguments. Mm, I don't know, like 5,000. Uh, okay, so now we need to get... Now we need to get the PID. Uh, so we need to PS aux, holy beep, but we without the arguments. How do you get PS aux without arguments, man? PS arc. Nah, yeah, I don't know. I don't care. Uh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do head on it. Head C. Mm, so here, grab. And I'm going to get only like first uh, 100 bytes because the PID is going to be there anyway. Now I have it, now I can replace it and I can do this and then I just wait for the, pl for the flag. So yeah, let's do it. Opening the shell. Uh, going to the temp directory, then creating a dev file and uh, linking, um, yeah, linking the console. So now, if this, when this opens dev console uh, while we are in temp, it's actually going to open the secret cake recipe, which is fine. Now I'm going to make the the FIFO, the pipe, the kernel buffer for pass passing data between processes. And now things are going to start happening quickly. I'm launching Hollybeep. It's not yet executed because Bash is waiting for this file to open this file and Bash is actually blocked on this. Um, I can do pgrep. Yeah, I know I can go do pgrep. Uh, oh, maybe, you know what? I, I'm going to do this pgrep. So thank you, Michal, for pgrep. I always forget about pgrep. Hollybeep. Yeah, all right. Now I'm going to do this and, uh, and then I'm going to do pgrep. 12, so I'm going to do kill dash 15, 12, like send signal number 15 to process number 12, and now I wait. Because the sleep is still sleeping, so this process is not yet, uh, uh, so cat isn't uh, receiving the data yet. Wait, wait, wait. Did it actually work? Yeah, it worked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got quite a lot of text at the beginning, and now we got the flag. Secret DCP. Okay, Pittsburgh Engineer's Cake, the maximum amount of final Gaussian process model trained on all Pittsburgh trails. Blah, 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 mixed flour baking. But that's an actual recipe, by the way. So, okay, so yeah, do, do check it out. Let me know if you baked the cake, actually. And let's open the final flag and, uh, yeah, and start to finish the stream. Done. We done it, and we we have a uh, fireworks as well. So the, I guess the cake wasn't a lie. Um, cool. Uh, by the way, uh, figuring this trick out with MK with a pipe isn't easy. You do have to know the internals of how these interprocess communication mechanisms work. If you don't know that, then you still can do it with a race condition. Like totally, you can do it with a race condition, but this makes it easy, like super easy this trick. Cool. So I guess that's it. Um, uh, okay. We can close this. We can close this. Again, I'm going to upload all my exploits to GitHub and there will be a link under the video if you don't know where my GitHub is. Um, and yeah, let's. I'm going to skim through the questions. If there are any questions related to today's stream, I'm going to answer them. If not, Depending on how many questions are there, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to go through all of them, sorry. Um, I will go through the related ones uh, with the stream. Mm. Okay, so... Who did the Keegan Me main from the main uh, CTF challenge? It was really cool challenge even if uh, I struggled to find second unmask trick at the end. Uh, I guess I'm I'm not going to reveal that until the offer reveals themselves, so yeah. Mm. What if I almost solve the task? Can I still post the write-up to the competition? Uh, you can try it, why not? Or you can like finish the task after the CDF and post the write-up. It's, you know, in the end it's, the, it's a write-up competition, right? 
Not a, not a who solved the challenge competition. Mm. Oh, if I made that uh, that light, no, I didn't make that light. That's uh, that's um, Aurora Leaf, I think it's called. <coughs> um, <laughs> uh, okay, this isn't related, but I answered it anyway. How was your team allowed uh, if you made three challenges for the CTF? Uh, were you playing with Dragon Sector? I didn't. Uh, I didn't play with Dragon Sector. No Googler was allowed to participate in the CTF, uh, and uh, yeah, no Googlers played. We were maintaining the CTF. We didn't communicate with our team. So yeah, our team was basically you no know, minus me, minus Euro, minus Jagger, uh, which means uh, what they did. They like got second place in the end anyway, so yeah, we don't really need it in that team anymore. Um, cool. Mm. Oh, I see two donations, but they are not not displaying because my script is saying uh, error occurred. Okay, so thank you to uh, the line for your donation. Um, uh, the line says, "Thank you for all the amazing streams, videos, and tasks. Uh, thank you for watching." Uh, Pavel donated um, again and says CTF, whoa, speed solving, kudos. Yeah, it, it was kind of fast, but I was in a hurry to get through all of them. It took three, three hours, over three hours anyway. So thank you, uh, Pavel, as well. Mm, okay. Do you think CTF can become an eSport? No, because uh, in eSport you actually need audience, and then CTF, the audience has nothing to watch. It's a hard problem, and if you have any great ideas, let us know. Um, how many times did you do dumpster diving? Uh, zero, because I didn't do physical pen tests. If I would do physical pen testing, then I would probably do them. Uh, may I give some hints to prepare for CTFs at Google CTF level? Play a lot of CTFs. Seriously, that's, that's the only thing I, uh, hint I can give you. Uh, Google CTF is pretty hard, and so is like, for example, the DEFCON qualifications and so on. So yeah, if you play a lot of CTFs, you get a lot of experience. So do that. Also do wargaming challenges. Like go to wechal.org, uh, sorry, wechal.net, and there are a lot of uh, wargaming challenges there. Why there was no uh, point assigned uh, for these tasks? Mm. Yeah, so uh, basically we wanted to... Um, for you know, to not not have a ranking, uh, to for the beginner quest to be pure fun, and I think that's uh, that, that was the idea behind it. Like no no stress, no ranking, and not don't get them motivated for being the last one. Just just have fun of so when solving the challenges. Mm Is it common way of marking flags as CTF with curly brackets? Uh, yes, basically yes. It's not always CTF at the beginning, it might be the name of a CTF, but it's a pretty common way. It's not used always, but it's pretty common. How many different tools are you using during CTFs? A lot. How many are requires? And I write even more scripts than, than I use tools usually, so yeah. Shell execution I found in less manuals, so... Uh, oh, so it's not related to man, it's actually related to less. Thank you, guest guest. You, you are correct. That, that might be it. How did they find that it was doing a carriage return? Uh, they found it was doing a carriage, re carriage return probably because they created the challenge. No, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't think the person told me created the challenge, but I don't know how they found it. My, maybe guessed it. Well, well done on it. I knew about that trick, obviously, but I didn't guess it. No way. Why does compressing increase the size? In case of entropy is really high, that means you cannot apply any compression. Um, that means that you still have to add the headers related to the compression, so that bloats the size. This is why uh, compressing adds the size. Uh, thank you, by the way, for all the hints about how to use John the Riper. I don't use it too, too much. Mm. Uh, from yeah, so from the uh, why did I use uh, why did I create a hash of uh, the zip? file when I was brute forcing it in John Viper. It wasn't the real hash. It was, I think, the encrypted data, um, and plus the CRC32 of it. So that wasn't a real hash. It's not, there is no hash in zip encryption. But that's a good point, Guest. Mm. Okay, I already addressed why I'm using, wasn't using the debugger on the 
web challenges, I was using tracing because, my, again, that's my personal preference. I prefer tracing over debugging. If you prefer debugging, that's fine. Like, whatever uh, allows you to be fast with solving the challenges, that's fine. I obviously know how to debug. I do prefer tracing. So, yeah, know the techniques, use the right tool. What keyboard layout are you using? Usually, like, uh, it's actually a modified Polish programmer's layout, uh, modified to include arrows and some other stuff. It's, it's pretty default. Uh, sorry that the terminal is barely visible on the, on the stream. I'm going to try to make it better visible uh, next time. My apologies. In, in Pate. Oh, in Pate. Oh, right, the Pate has... So I guess terminal is fine. Uh, yeah, I, I wasn't really sure if I will show Pate today, so... So without third-party third -party websites, was the XSS challenge solvable? Uh, not really. You need to host your... You need to gather the data somehow. So you, you need your either your own server or like XSS Hunter. Uh, where is the virtual machine videos I talked about earlier? Yeah, I think they are in the VM chip 8, uh, like chip 8 videos, and they are in, I think, like reverse engineering VMs or something like that. Um, how old am I? Uh, how young did I start learning? Um, I've, yeah, that's like, you know, it's pretty in individual how long does a person, how long does it take for a person to learn to be efficient? It took uh, ages for me, basically. Uh, I started programming when I was six and I'm 34 now. So yeah, do the math. And uh, yeah, it, it took me years to basically be pretty fast and efficient with, with this stuff. Um, Want to try the jump-oriented programming version? Uh, no, thank you. I'm not an expert in jump-oriented programming. Hmm. Am I going to do the normal tasks as well from the normal CTF? Yes, but uh, after the write-up competition is done, then I will go at least through mine, maybe through some others as well. Since there are so many protections against buffer overflows, uh, mm -mm -mm. our buffer overflows still exploitable uh, was basically the gist of a, of a message. Uh, so it's like this, on CTFs, uh, on like beginner CTFs, usually most of the protections are turned off. Here we saw only NX was enabled and in the second challenge uh, ASLR was enabled, but there was nothing else, right? The cookies and so on didn't exist. Um, that being said, on uh, Normal CTFs, you usually have most mitigations enabled in the compiler. You do not have them all unless the challenge is specifically about bypassing that one, like for example, CFG and so on. So you might have all of them enabled uh, in, in, you know, like normal uh, CTFs. Uh, mitigations are trying to mitigate an error. If you have enough vulnerabilities, you can always bypass a mitigation. So mitigation is not a fix. It's trying to, it's a heuristic, basically. It's trying its best, but there are ways usually to bypass it. Uh, but it does remove a single cross. Yeah, uh, that's my, I didn't, uh, damn, sorry. I didn't notice uh, it, uh, but it did remove in the two places. It didn't remove them in the third place. So, but what I was going after. Um, after live, can you show us how to decompile an executable? Uh, well, I, I guess using a five in IDA, but apart from that, uh, I'm not really familiar with the how with the decompilers, open source decompilers used nowadays. I know there was something called Boomerang, there was something called Snowman. Um, I don't remember the others. Just, just yeah, Google it. Sorry. <laughs> oh, uh, here we go. The script started uh, being alive again. So yeah, thank you again for the donations. Uh, these are the past donations. Yeah. Uh, by the way. Okay, uh, that's about it then for today. Uh, there are some other questions, but since we are already almost four, four hours into the seat, uh, into the, the stream, I'm not going to answer them today. Sorry. Uh, if you have any questions for me, just um, just email me. My email is on my blog, and I will put all the scripts I've written today to uh, to my GitHub. And that's it. So thank you uh, very much for watching. Um, I hope you learned something from it. And if that I was too fast for you, there will be a recording. You can always go back. You can always check again how something was solved. 
and yeah, basically that's it. So thank you to Kshaku for being here uh, out of time. And that's it. So yeah, see you next time and um, happy hacking. I'm going to leave you with uh, some music and uh, well, the message. <laughs> the whole